You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect in the kick. Got a million who's sick on my head. Got a million better put on the road. I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the third part of What If Naruto Joins Star Wars. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of Neon Zenjetsu on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Huigon had barely managed to scramble up the rampway and into the interior of the ship before the Konoha's hatch sealed and the frigate began to accelerate. He lay on the cold metal floor of the entry, his clothing with his sweat, his body bruised and battered. He breathed deeply, waiting for his pounding heart to quiet. He had barely escaped with his life, and the thought was worrisome. His opponent was strong, and had truly tested him severely. He was getting old, he decided, and he did not like the feeling. Naruto had fought that demon before and lived. Silently, the Jedi Master acknowledged the man's skill. If they hadn't been taken by surprise back there, if SHMI hadn't been injured, if the storm hadn't been hot on their heels they might have won the day. Too many ifs for his liking. He was better than this, they both were. But now was not the time for self-pity. qui -Gon shook his head and levered himself up on his elbows, grimacing at the strain caused by even that minuscule movement. Oi. Naruto rushed down the hallway in a blur of black and orange to help him to his feet, spouting expletives at no one in particular. That and Set trailed close behind Leku twitching in scarcely contained agitation, and it was hard to tell which of the group radiated more concern. It made him smile in spite of himself. Apparently, they had not taken the attack kindly. Were they the ones who had guided the ship in? If so, he owed them much, their lives and lack of trust aside. The blonde spoke first. That's twice I've pulled your ass out of the fire now. His voice was hoarse with both relief and pain as he hoisted the aging master to his feet. Keep this up and you might have to start running a tab. qui -Gon caught sight of an ugly wound between the Biscar plating, running from shoulder to hip. Maul's lightsaber had found him after all. Once again Naruto's deliberate durability absolutely astounded him. The bounty hunter should not have been able to stand with such a wound, let alone move. And yet here he was, helping him up as though nothing had happened. How are you still alive? Beneath this mask there is more than mere flesh, Naruto chortled bleakly and tapped a finger to his helmet. Beneath this mask there is an idea, my friend. And ideas, as I'm sure you've already discovered, nerve odd, are blasterproof, even lightsaber proof at times. qui -Gon frowned, recalling when Padme had shot Naruto in the head only two days before. Was he immortal? No, that was impossible. Not creature had eternal life. Not even one as inhumanly durable as Naruto. There had to be some trick to his near-godlike endurance. There just had to be. Oh, I can be killed, make no mistake. Naruto sensing his thoughts was quick to reassure him as he found his footing. But I don't much feel like telling you right now. Are you alright, Master Jedi? Said inquired of him as he rose, her crimson orbs searching his scathingly. She and her sister had discarded their diaphanous robes since he'd seen them last. Trading the loose garments in favor of traveling leathers not assimilar to those worn by Isla Secura leave it to Naruto to have a pair of those lying around the form-fitting fabric, though less revealing than their previous attire, still left little to a Jedi's imagination. If the girls were perturbed by the sudden scrutiny however, they did little to show it. We had feared you might have been caught in the blast, added Vet, but we are thankful you are unharmed nonetheless. I suppose I have your superior shooting skills to thank for that. qui -Gon quipped with a small smile. The twins smiled beneath his praise. SHMI Skywalker was nowhere to be seen, however, and it was with the briefest pang that the Jedi Master feared for her life. Despite this, he felt his curiosity went out. qui -Gon still didn't know exactly what to make of these Twi'lek twins, save that he didn't trust them. Not yet. The pair moved with the lithesome grace of dancers, but there was a surety to their movements, something that one did not find in a pair of ignorant slaves. A slight lilt to their speech whenever they spoke, one that seemed suggest their place of birth if not upbringing was not that of Ryloth. That they spoke fluent huddies and basic and apparently knew how to work the quad turrets on the Kanoha, only incensed his suspicions. These girls were not whom they appeared to be. But were they allies or enemies? He knew not. They had saved his life, however and for that, he would try to trust them. For now. Still, where was? So you made it after all. His fears were immediately allayed as SHMI Skywalker stepped into view. Her hair slightly disheveled from the unexpected attacks, yet no worse for the wear. She did seem to favor her right leg over left. 
but appeared otherwise unharmed despite the assassin's best efforts to kill her. But what of the child she bore? Hui Gan delved himself into the force, sensing what others could not sense, seeing what others could not see, and what he saw pleased him, greatly so. The tiny life the at SHMI Skywalker cradled in her womb, that growing cluster of cells, was amazingly intact. Despite Maul's savage attack, he could still sense life within her. Strong life, already strong in the force only a few days after being conceived. As if aware of his attention, Naruto's mate favored him with a small, grateful smile. Then she turned back to her husband. I'm fine, Naruto. She took his hand in her own, answering his own, unspoken question. Really, if anything, I'm more worried about. Her hand fell to her stomach and pulled him with it, cradling the flat skin there. Hui Gan smiled softly to himself as Naruto, sharp as ever, caught on. Vet and Set followed the motion with confusion dot 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 at first. Then, slowly comprehension dawned on their faces. Naruto's reaction was little more than spectacular. His eyes grew so large everyone was certain they were about to bug out of his head. No way. The words were choked, filled with emotion. No criffing way. SHMI nodded slowly. Yosh. Naruto exclaimed with a whoop, taking her by the waist and twirling her round and around like a top. I'm going to be a father. Again. He laughed boisterously and drew her close, his lips seeking her with an unrepentant joy. Heedless of qui -Gon and the others, for a moment, to the Jedi, the pair seemed to almost glow in the Force, burning brighter than even a supernova. All around him, the steel walls of the hold began to buckle, bending inward as though drawn by an unseen force. It was as if he were drawing the universe itself in. A harsh clang deep within the bowels of the ship jarred them apart, garnered their attention. There came another crash and hot on its heels a distinct, planetive cry, one everyone immediately recognized as belonging to that of a certain protocol droid. I say, Naruto facepalmed, 3PO, I told you not to touch anything. The sound of whirring servomotors caused everyone to look up. An HK-47 unit was advancing through the nearest archway, blaster in hand, its photoreceptors glowing an eerie red. Do you wish me to kill these meatbags, master? Before anyone could think to ask what a hunter-killer droid was doing in the hold, Naruto stepped forward, palms raised. I do not. He snapped in Japanese. The droid barked a query in the same flowing language qui -Gon couldn't comprehend. Baffling, the Jedi Master had traveled most of the known galaxy, visited countless words, seen things that Jedi half his age couldn't dream up on their best day. And yet here, he found himself confounded. Neither Mandalorian nor Huddies the Blonde seemed to be speaking another language altogether, composed of sharp, angular syllables he'd never heard before, let alone pronounced. Man and machine continued their terse conversation a moment longer before the latter finally relented. Very well. The droid lowered its weapons and assumed a more docile pose. I shall leave the meatbags alone dot 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 for now. The rest of his response was another series of words qui -Gon didn't understand, but they were caustic enough to peel rust off Durasteel. HK-47, Naruto barked in basic, followed by several more syllables of his native language. No, you cannot kill the Jedi. He's with me. Don't make me start calling you Killa again. Killa? qui -Gon's deadpan was barely concealed. Naruto blinked. Well, Killa sounded better than killer, you know. The hunter grinned. Besides, he hates that term. I do indeed. HK-47 chimed petulantly. SHMI giggled. The sound was swiftly stifled as Sparky came squealing around the corner, trilling insistently. Looks like your Padawan finally made contact. Naruto exhaled with a long, suffering sigh. But you and me, we're going to have a word about that assassin back there. The look in his eyes held a warning. qui -Gon had endangered the man's mate and they would have words about it. But not now. Later, resigning himself to a verbal tirade he followed the blonde upward, through twisting halls and corridors that doubtlessly lead to what must have been the cockpit. You know him. For now, qui -Gon made no effort to conceal his surprise as he trailed after the blonde. Know him? Naruto scoffed, the whites of his teeth gleaming in the low lighting. The last time we met, I almost killed him. That brought the Jedi Master up short. Had Naruto been holding back on Tatooine, then holding back because he'd been in the precincts of his wife. In the end, he never had a chance to ask him, because the blonde strode forward swiftly and pressed a button amidst the dash, activating his internal comlink with a soft chime. Nubian starship, I believe we have someone of yours. Naruto groused over the open calm. Dad. Anakin's voice rang out seconds later. As do we, was Obi-Wan's terse reply. You guys got an airlock. There was a silence from the Padawan on the other end. Then, finally, yes, docking tube. Another yes, let's hook her up then. The airlock cycled open and Anakin and Obi-Wan rushed down the hallway, practically tripping over one another in their haste to make it into Naruto's vessel. 
Anakin all but darted toward his parents, whilst Obi-Wan did the opposite, gravitating toward his master. Once more, HK-47 asked if he could kill the Jedi. Once more, Naruto barked a refusal. Finally, Anakin recovered his breath enough to speak. Are you all right? He asked his mother and father. We're fine, Annie. SHMI replied, smiling. Then it grew another inch. All three of us. Anakin blinked, baffled. All three. Naruto felt the realization settle upon his son in the same instant that SHMI touched a hand to her stomach. I'm gonna be a big brother. The boy exulted. Not so loud, Annie. These three dot 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 are ridiculous. Obi-Wan thought to himself, restraining a frown as he inspected his master for injuries. How could these people be so jubilant when Qui-Gon had nearly died? It galled him. Restraining himself, he voiced the concern he felt for his master. I believe I'm uninjured. The Jedi Master admitted, dusting himself off for what felt like the upteenth time since coming aboard the Kanoha. That was a surprise I won't soon forget. What sort of creature was it? Obi Wan pressed, brow furrowed darkly. He wants to go back and pick up where I left off, Qui Gon thought. The Jedi Master shook his head. I'm not sure. Whoever or whatever it was, he was trained in the Jedi arts. My guess is he was after the Queen. Such thoughts unnerved him. If it was Sith as he thought, was it the Master or the Apprentice? But before he could give voice to his second suspicion, someone else did. That was a Sith Apprentice, Nervod. Naruto's words were sharp and jagged, almost irritable. I thought even you would have recognized one. What do you know of Sith? Obi-Wan challenged. Naruto flashed a savage scowl at Obi-Wan, as though he couldn't believe the boy's ignorance. I know more about them than you'd think, whelp. The Padawan flushed, his anger quelled. Well, now that we've settled that, how's about we get into hyperspace before our friend gives chase? Naruto didn't wait for anyone's opinion he'd already ordered the Nubian starship bearing the Queen to retract their docking tube, already transmitted the coordinates to Coruscant. I'll be more than happy to answer all of your questions once we're underway. Without another word, he pulled a lever, and the Kanoha gave a massive lurch as her hyperdrive engaged. The stars streamed into distant lines, coalescing before the viewport, and then they were gone. Under Coruscant, even before an off-world traveler was close enough to understand why. He could tell that Coruscant was different from other planets. Seasoned space veterans were always amazed at how strange the planet looked from space, casting not the softer blue and white shades of planets still verdant and unspoiled, but an odd silverly glow that suggested the reflection of sunlight off metal. The impression was not misleading. The days in which Coruscant could be viewed in any sort of natural state were dead and gone. The capital city had expanded over the centuries, building by building, until it wrapped the entire planet. Forests, mountains, bodies of natural water, and natural formations had been covered over. The atmosphere was filtered through oxygen regulators and purified by scrubbers, and water was gathered and stored in massive artificial aquifers. Native animals, birds, plants, and fish could be found in museums or the climate-controlled indoor preserves. As Anakin Skywalker could clearly see from the viewport of the Kano has slowly descended form. Coruscant had become a planet of skyscrapers, their gleaming metal towers stretching skyward in a forest of spear points, an army of frozen giants blanketing the horizon in every direction. The boy stared at the city planet in awe, searching for a break in the endless forest of buildings, finding none. He glanced at his father in the pilot's seat, and Naruto smiled. He'd gone without his helmet or bucket as he so eloquently called it for the duration of their journey, allowing his son to see just how small that smile was. He knew at once that his father wasn't fond of Coruscant, but instead of asking why he patiently listened as his progenitor described the marvel into which they were descending. Coruscant, capital of the Republic, an entire planet evolved into one city. He sighed, leaning back in his chair. A nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live here. It's so huge. The boy breathed softly. You should see Mandalore. Naruto replied. Mandalore. Anakin bristled with excitement. His father had only ever mentioned the planet in passing. What's it like? You'll see, Naruto grinned. It's our next stop after this. Really? Really? Watch where you're driving, dear. SHMI chastised from behind them, but the words held no real rancor. It'd be a shame if we crashed after making it this far. Hi hi, Naruto laughed, pulling back on the thrusters. He knew better than to argue with his wife when she was pregnant. They dropped into a landfall traffic lane beside that of Queen and Madala's transport, and cruised slowly through the maze of buildings, sliding along the magnetic guidance lines that directed airborne vehicles. Naruto was more than happy to explain the vessel's controls to Anakin, who listened with half an ear, his attention still held captive by the vastness of the cityscape. In the background, Obi-Wan Kenobi moved silently. The learner was not at all pleased to be alone on the hunter's vessel, 
having been made separate from his master shortly before they'd entered the atmosphere. The Twi'lek twins Vet and Set never strayed far from SHMI. They were delighted to have this opportunity to speak with another female. Annie's mother seemed to be enjoying herself as well. Sparky would occasionally trundle past the trio. The little Astromich appeared to be every bit at home on the vessel. The plunky droid had even struck up an easy friendship with 3PO, much to the ire of Kenobi. HK-47 stood silently at attention. Occasionally he would ask for permission to kill the Padawan. Naruto's flat refusals did little to curb his enthusiasm. The Queen's transport slowed now, edging its way out of the traffic lane, onto a large landing dock that floated near a cluster of huge buildings. Naruto edged the Kanoha forward and followed. Anakin peered down with a bit of doubt. They were several hundred stories up, hundreds and hundreds of meters in the air. He tore his gaze away, swallowing hard. Relax, kid. Naruto soothed. It's not like we're going to crash or anything. The ships docked with a soft bump on the landing platform, their anti-grav clamps locking in place. Naruto was already rising from the chair even as she spoke, donning his helmet. A glance at HK-47 caused the droid to stand erect and follow him, pursued by Vet and Set, the latter flanking SHMI in silent formation. Their silent procession preceded Anakin down the passageway. Obi-Wan was waiting in the main corridor eager to disembark what he clearly though to be an unfriendly vessel. Naruto wasn't having any of it. What's your problem, Jedi? The Padawan grimaced. I've bad memories of bounty hunters. He admitted. Naruto scoffed. I'm not just a bounty hunter. He replied, seemingly put off by the boy's no-nonsense attitude. Nevertheless, you really have no idea how powerful I am, do you? The blonde continued, stretching out a hand. For example, I don't require the force to push or pull someone, though it is a handy tool. I'd only need my eyes. You are here in my ship as my guest, under my hospitality, and I expect you to behave as such. What do you mean by that? Obi Wan challenged. The hunter coughed a laugh and fell silent, stepping back to allow the Padawan passage. Perhaps you'll learn someday, Master Jedi. Giving his mother a quick smile, Anakin followed close on the heels of his father as he moved to the hatchway. The Kano has hatch slid open, the loading ramp lowered, and Obi Wan, Naruto, HK 47, Vet and Set, SHMI, and finally Anakin, exited into the sunlight of Coruscant. The boy spent the first few minutes concentrating on not being overwhelmed, which became even more difficult once he was outside the ship. He kept his eyes on the rampway and Naruto not allowing himself to look around for fear he might walk off into space. Would he have allowed himself to glance to the east, he would have seen the queen departing her own transport, flanking by qui -Gon and her guards. Obi Wan split off from Naruto's group almost immediately, rejoining his master as they approached the Rendezis. Pretty impressive, really. Two men clothed in robes of office of the Republic Senate stood at the end of the ramp flanked by a contingent of Republic guards. The Jedi approached then bowed formally in greeting. Anakin almost did the same then he realized no one his father's group not even Naruto himself was bowing, for reasons unbeknownst to him. Now Queen and Madala appeared, dressed in her black and gold robes with the feathered headpiece lending height and flow to her movements as she descended the ramp. Her handmaidens surrounded her from seeming ever angle. Wrapped in their cloaks of crimson, faces barely visible in the shadows of their drawn hoods. Captain Pinaka and his complement of Nabu guards escorted them. But Madala glanced at Naruto a moment before she stopped in front of the two men who waited, eyes shifting to the man with the kindly face and anxious eyes. Senator Palpatine, the Queen's emissary to the Republic of Senate, bowed now in welcome, hands clasped in the folds of his blue-green robes. It is a great relief to see you alive and well, Your Majesty. He offered with a smile, straightening once more. May I present Supreme Chancellor Valorum. Valorum Naruto noted was still a tall silver-haired man of indeterminate age, neither young nor old in appearance, but something of each, his bearing and voice were indeed strong, but his face and startling blue eyes looked tired and worried. Welcome, your highness, he said, a faint smile working its way onto his stern features. It is an honor to finally meet you in person. I must relay to you how distressed everyone is over the current situation on Nabu, and I have called for a special session of the Senate so that you may present your request for relief. One need not be a Jedi to feel the tension emanating from an Madala. The Queen held Valorum's gaze without even moving a fraction of a centimeter, tall and regal in her robes of office, white painted face as still and cool as ice. I am grateful for your concern, Chancellor, she said quietly almost to herself, out of the corner of his eye. Anakin recognized Padme staring out at his father from beneath her concealing hood. 
When he turned towards her she gave him a wink, and the young boy felt himself flush. He understood that his father had many admirers dot 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 so why did he feel so jealous whenever he caught someone staring at him? Nevertheless, a small part of him liked to think it had more to do with his reputation than his actual looks in that regard. Then again, he shouldn't be thinking such things. He was only nine. Still, that touch of resentment lingered as he thought of Padme staring at his father. Padme had since moved to the queen's side and was indicating an air shuttle that was waiting for them. When Naruto made no move to grant her request, she leaned forward to whisper something into her queen's ear something so soft that Anakin had no chance of hearing it. Naruto did. Augmented hearing aside, he could have heard a pin drop thanks to the audio sensors inside his helmet. Therefore he wasn't at all surprised when he heard the disguised queen did Padme honestly think she had fooled him like the rest. Quietly whisper to the handmaiden posing as her. We need him. Nodding, Admidala turned to face them. Would you care to join us, Master Bounty Hunter? She asked. I assure you, there's room enough in the shuttle. For a moment, Naruto considered refusing her request. He had no real reason to accompany Padme, certainly not after all the trouble she'd put him through. But for all his flaws our hero remained a kind person, and as he could still see the concern so thinly veiled in the handmaiden's eyes, his resolve crumbled. The shinobi menace surprised everyone Anakin included. At that moment by acquiescing to the queen's request and striding forward, shattering the silence, his son, followed by the rest of their strange little entourage, did the same, elicting a somewhat startled glance from Palpatine. Naruto took a perverse pleasure in discomforting the senator. He didn't know why but for some reason he simply didn't like him. It was almost as if this kind, grandfatherly act was just that, an act. A ruse, meant to hide the true, deceitful persona lurking beneath. But that couldn't possibly be true, right? Nevertheless, Naruto made a silent note to watch this little man better to be called paranoid with blaster ready than slumbering, and unprepared when the enemy came in the night. He released a bit of killer intent into the air, focused it solely upon the Sinsider Senator, curious to see what his reaction might be. I'm lady, Palpatine sputtered, almost as if he were aware of Naruto's killer intent. Are you certain that's wise? Huh? Naruto inwardly smirked. As I thought, he's a good actor. This man and his allies defended us at great personal risk to themselves. The queen's mouth quirked in a slight smile as she indicated Naruto and his fellows, unaware of the blonde's sure satisfaction. Surely we can make an exception for them. But, we owe them our lives, Senator. Her tone brooked no argument. Naruto thought he saw something dark settle across Palpatine's visage, just for an instant. Then it was gone, as though it had never been. His scrutiny deepened. Yes, this Palpatine definitely bore watching. Resigning his eyes to the enigmatic senator, he carefully ushered SHMI and Anakin inside. He bid HK-47 and the twins to halt before they too could enter the vehicle, coming up short well out the car's audio range. Watch over the ship, will ya? He asked of the trio, his helmet muffling his voice still further, and keep the engines warm. He risked a glance back at the air shuttle, unable to completely quell the foreboding that had seized upon him the moment they disembarked. I've got a bad feeling about this. Vet and Set nodded, wishing him well. And then they startled him. As one the twins stepped to him and laid a kiss upon either side of his helmet. Be safe, Hunter. They murmured. Naruto sputtered for a mere moment before finally regaining control of himself. Persistent lot. These two, almost as an afterthought, he turned to HK-47, accepting his jetpack from the latter. He had the succinct feeling he'd be needing it. Speaking of succinct, and no, Killa, you are not allowed to shoot either of them while I'm gone. The hunter-killer unit seemed to sulk a bit at that. Are there any meatbags I can shoot? He groused. Naruto touched a hand to the HK's shoulder. If this turns out the way I think it will, you'll have plenty of targets to shoot. Anyone comes by without the authorization code, I want you to blast them. HK-47 visibly brightened at the prospect of impending violence. I'll stay with the ship, then. Moving into the air shuttle with the queen, Anakin settled quietly in between his mother and father, idly wondering why they were even here at all. Senator Palpatine glanced over his shoulder at them from the front, a look of skepticism crossing his face as his gaze settled upon Naruto. It's a pleasure to finally meet of you, Shinobi Menace. Well, at least he was making an attempt to be cordial. It seems I have you to thank for returning Queen and Medalla to us. If he was trying to rile him, he'd have to do much better than that to rile his father, Anakin thought, as he watched his progenitor's T-Vizard helmet dip a fraction of an inch. My reputations precedes me, it seems. Indeed. Palpatine frowned thoughtfully before he turned away. 
There was something about that look it made Anakin nervous. Everything will be fine, Annie. SHMI whispered, stroking the back of his head soothingly. Of course it will. Naruto chortled. Now if you behave, I'll teach you that. That? Anakin nodded and tightened his mouth determinedly. He knew to which his father meant. Now he was determined to be on his best behavior. They flew only a short distance to another cluster of buildings in another loading dock. This one clearly meant for shuttlecraft. There, they disembarked and were escorted by Senator Palpatine to his quarters a portion of which had been made ready for the Queen and her entourage. SHMI and Anakin were given a room to themselves, a chance to clean up, and were summarily left alone. Apparently Naruto had business to discuss, not just with the Queen but with Palpatine as well. He left a clone with them, but for Annie, it wasn't the same. After a time, they were collected by one of the handmaidens not Padme, Anakin noted with disappointment, and escorted to a waiting room outside what appeared to be Palpatine's office. Wait here, the handmaiden instructed, and disappeared back down the hallway. SHMI contented herself to a nap having been was all but exhausted from the day's events whilst the clone stood guard within the doors. No one said or did anything. For a time, Anakin was content to do just that, to wait with his mother and the copy of his father. But then, as all small boys almost always do, he lost his patience. The doors to the senator's room were open and he could see inside clearly. The queen was present as expected, dressed now in a gown of dark velvet, which was wrapped about her slim form in layers, the sleeves long and full, hanging gracefully from her slender arms. A fan-shaped crown with ornate beadwork and tassels rested upon her head. She was sitting in a chair, listening as Palpatine spoke to her. Her handmaidens stood to one side, crimson robes and hoods drawn close about them. Anakin did not think either was Padme. He wondered if he should try to find her dot 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 then again. He didn't know where to look. He just considered dropping the matter altogether when he saw his father. Not the clone, but the original. Naruto was standing off to the side, positioned between Inmidala and Palpatine, a silent mediator in what seemed to be a decidedly one-sided conversation. The senator was gesturing animatedly as he stalked the room, the queen still as stone. Anakin wished he could hear what was being said. He glanced at Naruto's clone, and he could tell from the clone's restless eyes he was thinking the same thing. Go ahead. The doppelganger mouthed silently, giving his progeny permission to eavesdrop. When Captain Panaka walked past them and entered the room just beyond, screening him from view for just a moment, Anakin rose impulsively. The clone motioned him ahead, putting a finger to his lips in warning. He moved to one side of the doorway, pressing close. Through the crack between the open door and the jam, he could just make out the voices of Palpatine and the Queen, muffled and indistinct. Palpatine had stopped moving before the Queen, shaking his head. The Republic is not what it once was, he was saying. The Senate is full of greedy, squabbling delegates who only look out for themselves and their home systems. There is no interest in the common good no civility only politics. He sighed wearily. It's disgusting. I must be frank your majesty. There is little chance the Senate will act on this invasion. We need a stronger Supreme Chancellor, one not mired by corruption and these false accusations. Edmidala was silent a moment. Chancellor Valorum seems to think there is hope. And there is. Naruto stepped up abruptly, his helmet jerking in Palpatine's direction even as the senator opened his mouth to speak. If I may offer my own counsel. Cowed by killer intent, Palpatine reluctantly gave way and allowed the shinobi menace the floor. By all means, but Madala seemed almost relieved by the interruption, though wary she remained. Speak, send me. Naruto offered simply. If it's droids we're talking about here, I can end this little invasion of yours in less than a day. There was a silence. With all due respect menace, you are but a single man. Palpatine guffawed. You're hardly capable of decimating an entire army by yourself. I am. Anakin was astounded by his father's conviction. He'd seen firsthand some of the shinobi's terrible techniques, but to fig an entire army alone. That was too much, even for Naruto. Awed by his father's supreme and otherworldly confidence, Anakin continued to listen marveling at unfaltering figure whom he called Dad. We're talking about a full-scale war here, mind you. Even behind the helmet, the shinobi's deadpan was scarcely concealed. It's not going to be cheap, but it can be done. And I'm the man to do it. You make it sound as if you're charging us. This from Admidala. On Tatooine you made no such demand. Naruto snorted. That was a freebie. Besides, I've got a family to feed. Can either of you say the same? No, didn't think so. Permit me my doubt. Palpatine continued to argue. But I still do not see how you can possibly... You doubt my skills. Naruto shot back with a curt glance at Palpatine. 
understandable. Perhaps a demonstration is in order. Without waiting for an answer, he tugged off his helmet. Anakin froze. It was the eyes. He knew what Naruto's eyes looked like, and these were not them. Rippling irises of rimmed violet surveyed the room, taking everything at a glance. For a moment, just a moment, Anakin thought they settled upon him. A heartbeat later, and they were gone, returning to Palpatine. Have you ever heard of the Rinnegan, my dear senator? Naruto asked softly, his words dripping with sweet satisfaction. No, of course you haven't. Allow me to demonstrate. Bancho Tenen. Everything happened so swiftly then raised a hand and suddenly, the door behind which Anakin had taken refuse flew off its hinges with a squeal of protesting durasteel. Deprived of his cover Anakin was left standing agape, baffled by what he perceived to be a sudden trick, unable to do anything but smile sheepishly as Admidala and Palpatine turned towards him with startled gasps. Naruto was staring right at him, his lips quirked in the slightest of smiles. They faced each other in the silence that followed, father and son, eyes locked, and Anakin Skywalker, Charind, no longer hiding behind their door without wondered suddenly what had become of Qui-Gon Jinn. Meanwhile, unlike other buildings in the vast sprawl of Coruscant, the Jedi Temple stood alone, a colossal pyramid with mutable spires rising skyward from its flat top. It sat apart from everything at the end of a broad promenade linking it with bulkier, sharper-edged towers in which solitude and meditation were less likely to be found. Within the temple were housed the Jedi Knights and their students, the whole order engaged in contemplation and study of the Force, in codification of its dictates and mastery of its disciplines, and in training to serve the greater good it embodied. The Jedi Council room dominated a central portion of the complex. The Council itself was in session, its doors closed, its proceedings hidden from the eyes and ears of all but fourteen people. Twelve of them some non-human, others human comprised the Council, a diverse and seasoned group who had gravitated to the Order from the ends of the galaxy. The final two Jedi who were guests of the Council this afternoon were Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi, the latter having accompanied him to make their report before their fellow Jedi. The seats of the twelve Council members formed a circle, facing inward to where Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan stood, the former relating the events of the past few weeks including their encounter with Naruto the latter little more than stepped behind his master, listening attentively. The room was circular and domed, supported by graceful pillars spaced between broad windows open to the city and the light. The shape of the room and that of the Council seating reflected the Jedi belief in the equality, an interconnection between all things. In the world of the Jedi, the balance of life within the Force was pathway to understanding and peace. And yet Qui-Gon Jinn was not at peace as he stood within the Mosaic Circle that formed a speaker's platform for those who addressed the Council. The vision of his own death still haunted him and although he would never admit it aloud, he secretly feared his end. It was this same fear that he fought to keep his fellows from sussing out whilst he spoke. His tall, broad form and deep voice may have commanded the attention of those gathered here. His blue eyes may have fixed each in turn, constantly searching for a reaction to his words and yet he felt as though he were the one being read. Naruto would have laughed at his fear. After all, the man knew nothing of cowardice. His heart was that of a lion's, strong and proud, fiercely protective of his pride. And yet at the drop of a hat he could also be a trickster a deadly hunter willing to manipulate or deceive his adversaries to accomplish his goals. Time and time again he found himself wondering whether the blonde walked the path of darkness or light. At times, he seemed to both, as evidenced by his brutal slaughter of Watto. But did that make Naruto ally or enemy? Personally, Qui-Gon considered him the former. But that was neither here nor now. Again, the aging master willed himself to be calm as he took in his fellow masters. They watched him carefully, stately Kai Adi Mundi, young and beautiful Adi Gallia, slender to Pabalaba, crested and marble-faced even Peel, and all the others, each different and unique in appearance, each with something vital to offer as a representative of the council. Qui-Gon brought his eyes back to Mace Windu and Yoda, the ones he must convince, the ones most respected and powerful of those who sat in judgment. Silently, he steeled himself. He would be using Naruto's words here, trusting in the advice of a known bounty hunter equally known for his unscrupulous methods. Would they believe him? Doubtful, but he had to try. My conclusion, he finished quietly. His story completed, is that the one who attacked us on Tatooine is a Sith Lord. Another paused. The very same Sith who Darsha Asant barely escaped a few weeks ago. The silence that followed was palpable. Then there was a stirring of brown robes, a shifting of bodies and limbs. Glances were exchanged and murmurs of disbelief quickly voiced. Qui-Gon felt the seal upon his shoulder begin to pulse, a sure sign that Naruto or at the very least one of his clones was about to make an entrance. Of all the timing, 
For the life of him, he still didn't know when or why the hunter had put this Horatian mark on him, only that the blonde had been adamant, insisting it would save his life someday. As for right now he had the succinct feeling it was about to foul up the council. A Sith Lord? Mace Windu repeated with a growl, leaning forward. He was a strong, dark-skinned man with a shaved head and penetrating eyes, smooth face despite his years. Impossible. Kayati Mundi snapped irritably, not bothering to hide his dismay at the suggestion. The Sith have been gone for a millennium. Yoda shifted only slightly in his chair, a small and wizened presence in the company of much larger beings, eyes gone to slits like a contented sand panther's, his whiskery wrinkled face turned toward Quigons in deep thought. Threaten the Republic is, if involved, the Sith are, he observed in his soft, gravelly voice. The others began to mutter anew among themselves. Quigon said nothing, waiting them out. Obi Wan shifted uncertainly beside him. Quigon ignored him. The Jedi Master had other matters on his mind. He could sense Naruto now, like a starfighter drawing rapidly closer, moving at such speeds to boggle the mind. No, now was not time time. He silently urged the blonde to hold off, to refrain from his abrupt entry lest all their careful plans be knocked through. Incredible the blonde listened. Quigon felt the seal on his shoulder weaken, as the shinobi turned his attention elsewhere, averting certain catastrophe. He had listened to him out of respect for their friendship. It almost made the Jedi feel more than a little guilty knowing what he was about to say. Mace Windu leaned back heavily, his strong brow furrowing. This is difficult to accept, Quigon. I do not understand how the Sith could have returned without us knowing. Hard to see, the dark side is, Yoda said with a small snort. Discover who this assassin is, we must. Perhaps he will reveal himself again. Kai Adi Mundi suggested with a nod to Quigon. Yes, Mace Windu agreed. This attack was with purpose, that much is clear. Since he failed once, he may try again. Yoda lifted one skinny arm, pointing at Quigon. With this Nabu Queen, you must stay. Protect her, you must. The others murmured their approval, evidencing the confidence they felt in the Jedi Master's abilities. Still Quigon said nothing. We shall use all our resources to unravel this mystery and discover the identity of your attacker. Windu advised, one hand lifted in dismissal. May the force be with you, my old friend. May the force be with you. Yoda echoed. Obi Wan turned to leave. He stopped when Quigon did not follow, but instead remained standing before the council. Obi Wan held his breath, knowing what was coming. Yoda cocked his head questioningly. Master Quigon, more to say, have you? Maul. HRRMM. Naruto said the assassin's name was Maul. Quigon was cursing himself, even as the words left his lips. He hadn't meant to say them aloud in such a manner. But alas, his frustration had once more gotten the better of him. His irritation that they'd refused to connect the dots between this attack and Darsus. Now, he regretted his words. As one the council turned towards him. Their renewed scrutiny seemed to press down upon his shoulders like an unseen weight, burdening him with responsibility. Naruto. Mace arched an eyebrow, baffled. He remembered that name vaguely. An acquaintance of yours. Yes. He paused. A bounty hunter. I believe you are familiar with his title. And what might that be? A stoic even peel inquired. The shinobi menace. A ripple of disapproval ran through the council, rocking it to its core. Quigon knew they didn't trust hunters, and he didn't blame them. But Naruto was worse. Indeed, the council knew of him, in more ways than they ought to. Many of their knights and masters had encountered the infamous hunter more than once. He'd even saved Darsha Asant from this small character once before, by his account as well as hers. Eventually their mutterings subsided, leaving a deafening pall hanging over Quigon's head. Has he aided you? Adi Gallia asked with interest. Everyone knew the Shinobi menace had been of great help to her on Malastare. It was only natural for her to wonder about his intentions. He has, master. The Jedi replied, his gaze steady, resisting the urge to smile. Also, Huigon hesitated for yet a second time. He knew Naruto wouldn't take kindly to having himself exposed before the council or having his son tested. But now there was nothing he could do. He felt that it was the will of the Force that he'd encountered the boy when he had even if Naruto was his father. The Jedi Master took a deep breath readying steadying both body and mind for what he was about to say. He wasn't accustomed to switching gears like this, but it was all he could do. I have encountered a virgins in the Force. Yoda's eyes widened slightly. A virgins, you say, located around this Naruto person. Mace Windu asked quickly, his tone sharp. Perhaps, Quigon nodded, and his son. He knew he couldn't stop, not now. His cells have only the second highest concentration of midi-chlorians I have ever seen in a lifetime. He paused, knowing that if Naruto ever heard him speak these words aloud, if they ever got back to him, his head would land on a pike. 
it is possible he was conceived by midi-chlorians and not his parents. His words weren't truly a lie in and of itself he thought, merely his belief. Either Naruto or Annie were the one, and while he strongly suspected the latter, he wasn't willing to rule out the former either. There was a shocked silence this time. Kui Gan Jin was suggesting the impossible, that the boy was conceived not by human contact, but by the essence of all life, by the connectors of the force itself, the midi-chlorians. But there was more that troubled the Jedi Council. There was a prophecy, so old its origins had long since been lost, that a chosen one would appear, imbued with an abundance of midi-chlorians, a being strong with the force and destined to alter the very fabric of life forever. It was Mace Windu who gave voice to the council's thoughts. You speak of the prophecy, he said quietly, of the one whole will bring balance to the force. You believe it is this boy. Or, he added with just a touch of something bordering on disdain, this bounty hunter. Mace didn't have to speak of his disdain for Naruto. He was a known traditionalist and Naruto, by his very being, defied tradition on an almost daily basis. Perhaps that was why he and Naruto got along so well, Qui-Gon thought wryly. They were always breaking with the accepted norm. But now, faced with their intrigue, Qui-Gon paused. I don't presume, but you do. Yoda snapped challengingly, revealed, your opinion is, Qui-Gon. The Jedi Master willed himself to be still and calm, placid, the surface of a pool. I request the boy be tested. Again, there was silence as the members of the council exchanged glances, communicating without words. Eyes shift F back to qui -Gon. To be trained as a Jedi, you request for him. Yoda asked softly, for the boy. It was with a pang that the Jedi Master realized they were not speaking of Naruto. But no, the man could never be a Jedi. He would see the Jedi as staunch conservatives, unwilling to do what was necessary. No, Naruto could never be a Jedi. But perhaps his son, finding him was the will of the Force. Qui Gon pressed ahead recklessly. I have no doubt of it. There is too much happening here for it to be anything else. Mace Windu held up one hand, bringing the debate to a close. Bring him before us, then. Yoda nodded somberly, eyes closing. Tested, he will be. Elsewhere, what did I tell you about eavesdropping? Naruto was chastising his son for but the words held no rancor. Inwardly he was proud of the boy. He'd just displayed the first true quality of a shinobi. Curiosity. He'd never been so proud. Palpatine and Amidala had despite Naruto's offer to handle the problem, departed for their so-called special session of the Senate, leaving mother, father and son alone in their temporary apartment. SHMI had since woken from her nap. Now, she was dutifully combing her son's hair as her husband paced restlessly to and fro before them. Sorry, Anakin sulked. No, no. Naruto shook his head. I told you do it without being detected, remember. The boy's smile promptly flipped itself upside down. So I did good, then. Well you would've, but I could hear you a mile away. Naruto glanced at his clone, dispelling the doppelganger with his glance. Still, you did pretty damn good, considering you haven't had any formal training. We'll have to fix that once we get to Mandalore. Anakin visibly brightened at the mention of the planet. So we're really going there. Naruto glanced over at SHMI, as though awaiting her permission. Anakin looked up at his mother from where he sat in her lap, eagerly anticipating her answer. His mother sighed. Of course we are. She soothed. You know we only want the best for you. But what about being a Jedi? Naruto bristled. SHMI's reaction wasn't as severe, but she did frown slightly. Do you want to be a Jedi, Annie? Anakin frowned. That was a good question. What did he want? Part of him wanted to be a shinobi, hunter like his father. But on the other hand, he also wanted to be Jedi to protect the innocent and hunt down evildoers so that he might bring them to justice. Arg, it was so hard to decide. Couldn't he just do both? He looked up at Naruto, prepared to ask that very question, when he remembered something. Dad, what's wrong with your eyes? Oh, these. Naruto, eager to change the topic, blinked once and those black violet swirls faded to his true blue sapphire once more. Just something I picked up a few years ago while I was training with Django. They're called the Rinnegan. Pretty cool, huh? I still haven't mastered them as of quite yet though. They always a major drain on my stamina and I can't use any of my other abilities for 5 seconds afterwards dot 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 so I prefer not to use it unless I absolutely have to. Can you show me? Oh, I suppose. Naruto turned toward the battered door, eyes flaring into violent violet. Anakin marveled at them. His father's very being seemed to change when he used them. His goofy persona falling away replaced by a stern-faced warrior, whose expression harkened back to his shinobi days. Darling, SHMI cautioned. Relax, babe. 
Her husband grinned. I got this. Bracing himself, he faced away from them, raised a hand, and uttered two words. Shinra Tensei. The sheet of metal flew like a frisbee from the floor, caroming off the wall to shatter a nearby viewport plummeting to the ground below. But now there were pieces of glass hurtling towards them. Naruto raised a hand again and the shards found themselves harmlessly deflected by the intense power of his eyes, sending them clattering softly across the carpeted floor. Anakin thought he saw a bead of sweat drip down his father's face as he lowered his hand slightly. He did look slightly out of breath, as if the effort had drained him somehow. But Annie's enthusiasm remained very much the same. Can I do it, too? He asked, awed by the display. Naruto facepalmed and Kirama barked a laugh. Kids these days, kids these days. Anakin's face fell. So I can't, then. Hmm. Naruto seemed to appraise him for a long moment. Well, you might be able to. He decided at last. You're half Yuzumaki after all. Anything's possible. Hell, you could even his mouth hung open. As if he wanted say more when his wrist mounted come link beeped. Without thinking, he activated it. Moshi Moshi. Kid. Jango Fett's voice growled from the other end, startling him. We need to talk. Now, Naruto gave SHMI a swift kiss upon the lips, elicting a soft flush from his wife before she returned it, her tongue tangling in his. The shinobi bit back a growl of desire as she gave a cute moan of her own, hands tangling in his hair for the briefest of instants. Suddenly, he found didn't want to take Django's call. But he had to. She knew he had to take the call, if anything she was used to this. Anakin wasn't. Certainly not the kissing. Phew. Anakin groaned as they continued their lip lock. Gross. I said we need to talk. A miniature hologram of Django snapped into existence above the small holo projector on Naruto's arm. Persistent. Sighing. The blonde broke away. Do we now? Naruto's grin looked like it belonged on the devil himself, not a bounty hunter. Ahaha. So that little stun back on Tatooine had finally paid off at last. It was all he could do not to laugh. Ittering softly at the thought he excused himself from Annie and SHMI, stepping out the door and into the parlor to speak with his old teacher and friend. He continued walking, knowing Shim and Annie were perfectly safe here in these apartments and yet at the same time not wanting them to know what he had done on Tatooine. Explain yourself. Django wasted no time in cutting to the meat of the matter. Or I'll put a bounty on your head so high you won't be able to come within three parsecs of a civilized system. Oh ho. Hirama's grin mirrored his own. Looks like he found out. Did you like the gift I sent you? Naruto asked conversationally. Don't play dumb, whelp. Why for the love of Mandalore did you impersonate me and purchase all those slaves in my name? His mentor demanded to know. My account is depleted by half. And then you sent them to Kamino. As he spoke Naruto could hear a sorceress of voices in the background. Evidently that transport had made it to the storm-tossed world after all. He could just imagine the look on Jango Sensei's face. Ma, Sensei, you know how I feel about slavery besides. I know you'll be good to them. Anyway, it's not like I did anything wrong. You blew Jabba to bits. Jango exclaimed. How does that strike you as not wrong? Ura, uh, so that bomb went off after all. Naruto whistled innocently. Slimy Hut deserved it. Hell yes he did. Boy. Jango was furious. He would not be distracted any longer. If you don't pay me back. Relax, relax. Naruto soothed. I've got a major job lined up right now, I'll pay you back dot 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 with interest. Tell you what, I'll even buy Babaka a gift when Tanwi lets him out of that tank. They both knew to whom he was referring. Django's one wish was to leave behind a legacy as his own mentor had. And this clone of him would be just that. An unaltered clone, no accelerated growth. He hadn't even been born yet, and wouldn't be for several months yet. But at the mention of his son-to-be, the tension in Django's voice visibly dissipated. What's the job? It's nothing, Naruto replied. I'm just going to tear the Trade Federation a new asshole. Hush hush stuff and all that. But Midala isn't one for violence, but I'm sure I can convince her. I don't need 300 million creds, so I'll gladly give you half, eh? Both men knew who would win if it came to a fight now. Naruto. He'd long since mastered the tools of his trade, and with his shinobi abilities, there was simply no contest. He had a debt toward Django, however, and it was one he would gladly repay for all those years of training. Fine. Django didn't do subdued. He sound only slightly less dangerous than usual. Just don't send me any more women. Yes, sir. Naruto snapped off a mock salute as the hologram growled and winked out of existence. Django out. He'll thank you later. Hirama chided. Kami knows that man could use a woman in his life. Amen to that. Naruto chuckled, mentally high-fiving his tenant. He was still chuckling when he returned to the apartment a few minutes later. SHMI was still there. Anakin wasn't. He took one look at his wife's dour expression, and a pit of dread opened inside his stomach. 
He almost didn't want to ask what had happened in the few five minutes that he'd been gone. But he asked anyway. Where's Annie? Master Quigon came by while you were gone. SHMI replied by way of greeting. He wanted to bring the two of you to the temple and Annie wanted to go so. Naruto's eyes blazed red. He went where? He hissed, this time. He didn't even bother to ignite his jetpack. He simply made a hand sign. Seconds later, Ayla Sakura cried out in surprise, looking up from her datapad in disbelieving shock as a blur of black and gold slammed into the floor mere yards away in the halls of the Jedi Temple, their impact all but shattering the marble floor to pieces beneath their feet. Even as they rose they lashed out, an invisible force spreading out from all angle. Several Padawan learners were thrown back from the conquisitive wave, but the intruder made no move to follow up on their attack. Instead they marched forward. Grim and resolute, eyes blazing like azure fire in their head, mouth twisted in a rictus of fury. Were it not for those sweet sapphire eyes and beautiful blonde hair, she'd never have recognized them at all. But Ayla did recognize them him, and it was her cry that brought the intruder up short before the other Padawans could advance upon him. She shot them a scathing glare, demanding that they stand down. Then and only then did she truly call out to the intruder. Naruto. The blonde blinked and half-cocked his head, struggling to place the voice. It sounded so familiar. He whipped around and it was then that Isla recognized him. This armored Mandalorian who burned in the force like an invisible flame, causing the floor, walls and the very ceiling overhead to buckle in his presence. Isla. It was more a statement than an actual greeting. His head inclined the merest of millimeters in her direction. You're looking well. Something about that gaze of his set her skin to burning, blazed her very soul aflame. The longer she looked at him, the more something stirred in her, a feeling she'd worked so hard to suppress since meeting him. In the end, it was all the Twi'lek could do to jerk her gaze away, barely breaking eye contact before she lost herself. Breathing deeply, she shook off her emotions and spoke clearly, calmly, coolly. What brings you here to the temple? However cordial his expression might have once been it was no longer, as her words Naruto's visage solidified into a stern scowl. Oh nothing, he murmured, just here to get my boy back. Without another word he marched on, leaving the Twi'lek woman to wonder just what he'd meant by that. Now that she thought about it, Qui-Gon Jinn had passed by here a few minutes ago with a boy. Isla had watched him go then, and now the gears in her mind were begin to turn. Wait, her leku twitched in realization. Naruto had a child. Yes, that must be it. The anger in his eyes, the ire in his words, nothing else could explain it. But still, it was strange. Why did her heart suddenly hurt so much? She hadn't been wounded everywhere, and yet it felt as though a lightsaber had been thrust through her chest. What the devil dot 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 was wrong with her? Darsha Asant her new Padawan had warned her the blonde was of the volatile sort, that he set emotions off in people. But at his passing she'd felt a strange energy emanating from him and he was headed for the council chambers. Naruto, she cried, running after him. Wait, Ba Kram. Hui Gon bristled as a sudden commotion coming from beyond the council chambers. Anakin must have heard it as well, because the boy cocked his head, blue eyes widening in recognition. Dad, he murmured, almost to himself. The other masters looked up at the sound, confusion, then concern marring their features. The doors shuddered violently from an unseen strike. Wait, a woman's voice eyeless, cried from outside the temple doors. You need a key. I don't need no goddamn key, came the answer. Shinra Tensei. With an invisible blow, the doors blew themselves outward. Naruto stormed inside, eyes ablaze, Isla trailing after him in disbelief. Anakin paid no attention to her. Rather, he couldn't. Rather, he had just enough time to notice his eyes were swirling with the rinnegan snarling rippling violet as he bellowed out three words. Anakin tried, tentatively, to raise his hand, but to avail, he was frozen on the spot as Naruto snarled out. Where's my boy? Well, well, well. Naruto chortled softly to himself, shaking his head from side to side. I disappear for five minutes and the Jedi kidnap my kid. Why am I not surprised? He carried himself into the center dais with long, swift strides, Rinnegan eyes roaming across each Jedi with a look that could only be described as pure venom. Anakin swallowed nervously, desperate to stifle his rising gorge as he beheld the enraged hunter standing before him. His previous shout had long since faded, replaced by an almost eerie calm. But it was just a front, a facade for the fury lurking just beneath the surface. To the Jedi, far more in tune with the Force than Anakin, his father's fury must have been all that more tangible. The Force seemed to surge around him like a thing alive, angry and wild, ready to last out at the slightest provocation. And that was without his chakra. His father's eyes were a whirling whirlpools of Imtaten, the angry slits of Kirama's eyes vying with that of the Rinnegan's round pupils and the blank, horizontal slates of Senen mode. 
Naruto's hand kept twitching toward the hilt of his lightsaber as though he were intent upon carving everyone in the room save that of his son into bloodied, unrecognizable chunks. This couldn't end well. Annie thought to himself, it couldn't possibly. And then, incredibly, the blonde laughed. Aha. Uh -huh. His father's face broke out in a wide grin as he laid eyes upon him. There you are, kiddo. Something about that smile felt a great deal forced. Be a good boy and cover your ears. Naruto said softly. What? I said cover your ears. Anakin hastily complied, screwing both fingers into his ears in the same moment that his parent drew breath. Then, MF criffing assholes. Anakin cringed, ears ringing despite his best attempts to stifle them. So loud. Phew. Naruto hissed at Ayla, eyes narrowing to vicious slits as he regarded the Twi'lek woman. I'm going to exempt you from everything I'm about to say, because for the life of me, this doesn't strike me as anything you'd have a hand in. But when this is over, we are going to have a good long talk about your morals, you and I. His actions earned him a tentative nod. And you, Naruto roared, rounding on Qui-Gon. You're even worse. I turn my back for five minutes, five F minutes, and you make off with my kid. The hell is with that, huh? I thought I could trust you to respect my wishes. What do you have to say for yourself? Naruto, I had wished to have you tested together. The Jedi Master began slowly, choosing his words with care. I meant no offense by taking your son alone. Offense has been taken, fuckface. We gone arched an eyebrow at the crass curse. All right, my bad. Naruto drew in a deep breath as everyone in the room gawped at him. Perhaps I overreached it a bit there, said too much. Shall we try this again? Start over you know. Sighing he straightened from his crouch, armor rustling like a thing alive as he rose. Then he smacked a palm into the center of his hand. The very sound caused Anakin to flinch. First, what? He declared, over loud. Second, the F. This exclamation was accompanied by a violent burst of unseen energy, shattering viewports and overturning chairs as the full force of his anger was unleashed. Jedi were blown backwards. It seemed it was all Qui-Gon and Ayla could do to keep their footing. All their strength was required to stand amidst the sudden exertion of energy. Anakin felt none of it. His father's wrath seemed to flow harmlessly around him like a river parting before a stone, leaving him completely untouched despite the chaos raging around them. Awaken the sleeping giant we have. Yoda exclaimed. You think? The council seemed to rise from their tumbling seats as one effortlessly evading the worst of the savage storm summoned by the blonde's righteous wrath. If Naruto was at all alarmed by the prospect of facing several accomplished force users together, then he did little to show it. He made another motion with his hand, battering the Jedi with their own chairs preventing them from focusing their efforts upon him. Some of them were not so wise as to see through this trick however, somewhere in of the confusion of the storm Kit Fisto made the mistake of igniting his lightsaber. Its eclectic snap hiss sizzled across the room. It was like flicking a switch. In an instant, Master Windu and the others did the same, leaving Anakin's father facing a sea of blazing blades. Oh, so you wanna play, do ya? Naruto snarled sibilantly. All right, then. In a swift motion he'd ignited his own lightsaber and brought it to bear, the eerie jaddened blade casting his face in ghostly pallor. Let's play shall we? He made a flicking gesture with one hand. Before Isla could think to ready herself he found her lightsaber torn from her belt, its hilt snapping into Naruto's palm to ignite seconds later. Both blades roared anew, crossing in anticipation of the battle to come. Abruptly, he smiled. Say, I have a better idea. Why don't you all uh, sit? Naruto made no motion with his hands or even his head. Instead he merely uttered a single word, and eleven members of the Jedi Council crushed against the walls in a bodily heap hastily deactivating their lightsabers before their loss of footing also resulted in loss of limb and life. Isla was baffled by the sight, both shocked and relieved that she hadn't been the target of the blonde's monumental assault. Instead, she along with Qui-Gon and his young apprentice, Obi-Wan Kenobi, were left to look on in disbelief as he held the masters there against their own will, solid footing preempted by an unseen energy that no one could explain, that no one could withstand. Save one. Yoda alone held his ground, his diminutive unflinching beneath the unseen strain that had so easily quashed the other masters. Unlike his fellow Jedi, he had yet to activate his lightsaber the cylinder hung and used at his side. His gnarled hands wrapped tight around his walking staff. Clearly wasn't the force itself at work here, Isla wondered. Naruto had yet to do anything other than restrain the council perhaps this could yet end with only a modicum of aggression on either side. What happened next sent that hope crashing down around her ears. Well, well. Naruto rumbled, his eyes little more than crimson slits in the shadows of those bangs, his face a rictus of fierce fury. Looks like I get to have a little fun after all. Why come here, have you? The aging Jedi inquired. I'm here for my kid. The shinobi answered, seething. 
you won't be filling his head with your emotionless mumbo jumbo. Allow you to take him, I cannot. Tested first, he must be. Naruto's left eye twitched and he muttered something in Mandalorian. More Jedi hypocrisy. A shake of the head was all he needed to convey his disdain. Your arrogance knows no bounds. You claim to serve the balance, you pretend to be a traditionalist. But where is your tradition? Here and now, thrown to the wayside. This is precisely why I don't use the force. If anyone's going to train my boy at anything it'll be me. Calm yourself, you must. Yoda continued to caution. The dark side, I sense in you. Like an iron trap, Naruto's gaze locked onto the Jedi's own. The sheer intensity of his stare, the sudden ice in his expression, was enough to silence the room. Nothing moved. Nothing breathed. Nothing at all. And then he spoke, voice black as pitch, eyes cold as the coldest winter. Don't make me destroy you. He warned. Euler realized Yoda was right. At the mention of his son, the energy around Naruto had gone from light to dark in the blink of an eye. It was as if he'd stepped from the sun and into shadow. But how, and why, for that matter, clearly something was upsetting him here more than met the eye. Was that the cause of his outburst, she wondered. She longed to stop the blonde, but knew that any interference on her part could easily end in the situation spinning even further out of control. And now that he had her lightsaber, there really wasn't all that much she could do without him sensing her. In the end, she was forced to stand there, helpless, with Qui-Gon and his young apprentice. Only deal in Absolutals, Sith do. Yoda was saying as she came back to herself, the force effortlessly guiding the hilt of his saber into a three-fingered hand. Do what I must, shall I? Ha. Huh? The blonde retorted. I'm no Sith. But when I get through with you dot 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 they'll look merciful. Anakin cringed. He knew quite well what was about to happen. What would occur if someone didn't enter even? Just as he was loath to explain it. Oh this is bad, this is bad, this is so very bad. He'd only ever seen his father like this once before. He'd been five at the time, barely able to remember much of anything. But he'd certainly remembered this. An ill-fated band of Tuscan raiders encroaching upon their settlement nearly made off with his mother and as a matter of recourse. Naruto had gone out to Indy afterwards while there had been a lot of bodies. But even that fury paled in comparison to this wicked, white-hot rage roiling off his progenitor's body. It was as if the force itself were cringing away in outright fear, not that Anakin blamed it. Qui-Gon was of a similar mind. If he'd had any idea Naruto would react so violently to his taking of Anakin dot 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 well, there was no use in reconsidering that now. The past was the past, and now he had to contend with the consequences brought about by his foolish actions. Right now, he had to find some way of keeping the blonde from obliterating the council, and possibly himself alongside the entire Jedi Temple. As far as Obi-Wan was concerned the matter was a foregone conclusion. The young Jedi was frustrated and embarrassed for his master, who had clearly overstepped his bounds once again. And this time dot 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 he just might have to pay for it, pay something most dear. Qui-Gon had been right in his suspicions that the boy was possessed of an inordinately high midi-chlorian count. After all, Obi-Wan had run the test himself, but it was clear to him now that Naruto was many times stronger than his progeny. Alone, the shinobi was somehow able to hold the combined council at bay through sheer effort alone. Anyone who could do such a thing was truly a force to be reckoned with. The only question remaining was what he'd do next. Would he back down and submit to Yoda's guidance? Or would he simply eradicate them on the spot? Obi-Wan sincerely hoped and prayed for the former. No matter how powerful this warrior might be, surely Master Yoda could at the very least slow him somehow. Right. Wrong. Last chance. The hunter hissed. Let us leave, and I promise you won't come to any more harm than you already have. Yoda's only response was to finger the activation stud of his saber. The blonde exhaled in a long-suffering sigh. Don't say I didn't warn you. Naruto cut down at the Grand Master in a lightning-fast motion, his saber moving faster than the naked eye could see. Even with all the power of the force at his command, the blonde's attack registered as a little more than a blazing blur in the eyes of Master Yoda. He scarcely had time to raise his wrist and parry, the bounty hunter's stolen weapon slamming against the little green man's shoto a split second after it activated. Furious didn't even begin to describe the sheer amount of energy behind that strike. It caused the chamber floor to crater and crack and all but rip the saber from Yoda's hand. Before the Grand Master could recall it back to his hand the blonde blinked, a pulse of Shinra Tensei sending the cylinder skittering across the shattered tiles, clattering end over end before finally falling out the shattered viewport. Qui-Gon saw it as well, there had been no subtlety behind the blow, no technique whatsoever. Just pure power. They'd all been fooled. Though he might know it Naruto didn't need technique he could simply overpower his opponent, bludgeoning them into oblivion. Removing Yoda's lightsaber from the battle had been a nice touch as well. 
and with his mental hold pinning the council down, Yoda couldn't draw another. He certainly had yet to make a move in that regard toward their unconscious bodies. But the blonde had forgotten something, Qui-Gon realized. For all his immunity to the Force, it wasn't flawless. Well now, Naruto laughed, drawing back with a slight smile. I do believe this is Chekma Oof. Before he could finish, the Grand Master lashed out and within a supreme effort of will, launched the bounty hunter from the room. Anakin felt his heart wrench at the sight. He'd never seen his father fly so far in all his life. Never heard such a painful crap in all his years as his progenitor's body struck the adjacent wall. He didn't get up again. A silence fell over the room as they felt his life force dwindle, withering away. When he screamed it, felt as though someone else were screaming with him, dark power welling up inside. Dad. In hindsight it made sense, at least to Qui-Gon. Only someone of Yoda's caliber could rip through the Naruto's force density and telekinetically hurl him across the room. Still dot 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 to think it would have killed the blonde. He felt an odd twinge of guilt at that. He could feel Anakin's anger boiling at them like a thing alive, poisoning him with hate. If only they could have avoided this. What did you seriously think that would work? Five heads snapped toward the prone body, just in time to witness the inert Naruto vanish in a plume of smoke and steam. A blur of motion registered in Yoda's parapals, accompanied by the scintillating snap hiss of a lightsaber. Then it was over. No heads rolled. No body parts flopped away from their host. There was simply the scent of cooking flesh. Even Qui-Gon was baffled. Back down, Naruto bit out, his stolen saber singing a thin line against Yoda's neck. Our business here is concluded. Unless you'd like to lose your head. His gaze snapped to Qui-Gon and for a moment, Anakin feared the worst. Would his father last out and attempt to end the Jedi's life for what he'd done? But he didn't. Instead, he smiled and blinked, the merest flutterings of his lashes. And Qui-Gon flew. His back slammed into Obi-Wan, his apprentice barely catching him before he fell, the wind knocked out of him. Naruto snapped of a sarcastic salute as he made his way towards his son. I'll see you on Naboo, old friend. His eyes narrowed whilst he spoke this, the kind of expression he wore when one of his clones dispersed, relaying information. Perhaps had he known Padme had just finished begging his father for aid on Nabu aid sanctioned by the Senate itself, he might have been a touch more wary, jealous even. But he was too young he couldn't possibly know such things. Nor could he know that in this instant his fate had been radically changed forevermore, tossed from one track to the other by Naruto's divine intervention. The tapestry of life itself would soon change for him. But for now, the boy was left to wonder why in blazes they were going to Nabu. Was Naruto going to fight a war? He wondered. Such thoughts were unbecoming of him. Besides, we'll train him. Naruto was addressing the still shaken council. You have no say in the matter. If any of you, and I mean any of you try to anything to him, I will come for you. You won't know where or when, but I will and when I do you'll wish I'd killed you today. He punctuated his speech with a middle-fingered salute and blinked once more, scattering the debris from the floor. Another blink released the crushing hold he had on the council, finally allowing the esteemed Jedi to rise from their involuntary captivity. Wisely, none of them dared make a move against him. Not even Mace Windu has faced the most startling shade of red. Naruto paid him no heed, deactivating his lightsabers, tossing Ayla's back to her. The Twi'lek caught at it with fumbling fingers, her hands closing around the hilt and muted thanks a heartbeat later. If Naruto at all felt her gratitude, he did little to show it. But he did speak to her. I'm glad to see you weren't so foolish as these old men. Ayla started in surprise. Whatever do you mean? Naruto's only response was to stride on with a smile. Whatever his thoughts were, he wasn't going to reveal them here in front of the council. I wonder. Without another word, he turned back to his son. Coming, Eddie. Anakin didn't hesitate for a moment. He latched onto his father's hand and held tight a split second before a burst of hurrishin ripped them from the Jedi Temple and catapulted them across Coruscant. He felt the air in his lungs rush out in a great gasp as often happened during interspatial travel it felt as though the universe itself were trying to tear him apart from every angle. How did his father do this? It was a miracle in and itself and then they'd arrived, safe and sound in their apartment once more. Anakin. His mother was there to greet him with her soft embrace as though she'd somehow sensed the turmoil taking place in the temple. Naruto graced S.H. Mai's cheek with the lightest of kisses, muttering something about this ship needing refueling. He was out the door again almost before Anakin could blink, but this time, he left a clone behind to guard them. He would not be making the same mistake twice. Nevertheless, Anakin was given a rare sight of his father's fury that day. That image would forever be branded into his young mind for years to come. Preparations for departure would already be underway, and they would depart with the Queen within the hour, with or without the Jedi.
Anakin's destiny had only just begun to unfold. Already ripples of Naruto's actions were still being felt back at the council. That was foolish of me, Qui-Gon said at last, admitting his only folly as his disciple helped him stand. Obi-Wan bit off his reply and looked away, thinking to himself that Qui-Gon was right, but that maybe this time he should consider taking his own advice. Council members were just now reclaiming their footing, visibly shaken by the spectacle that had taken place. An attack on the order of this magnitude, of this audacity, was all but unprecedented. Now is not the time for this. Confusion. Mace Windu was amongst the first to seat himself, also the first to find his voice, though the coloring of his face had yet to fully fade. As I'm sure you already know, the Senate will vote tomorrow for a new Supreme Chancellor. Queen and Madala returns home. We are advised, which will put pressure on the Federation and could widen the confrontation. Those responsible will be quick to act upon these new events, as may the menace himself. We cannot allow this incident to damage our credibility, even further. He stated with finality, his gaze falling upon qui -Gon. To his credit, the older Jedi flinched only a tad and otherwise hid his concern well. Drawn out of hiding, her attackers will be, Yoda whispered, breaking their short-lived confrontation. Events are moving too fast for distractions such as this, Kai Adi Mundi added. Mace Windu took a quick look about the destruction. Those sitting at the council then turned once more to qui -Gon and Obi-Wan. If the menace is headed for Naboo, then so must you. Go with the queen and discover the intentions of this dark warrior who attacked you, be it Sif or otherwise. That is the clue we need to unravel this mystery. And if Naruto interferes, there was a silence. Then do what you will, Mace answered. Isla knew at once that those words didn't sit well with qui -Gon, But for some reason, the older Jedi didn't speak up. Besides, she soon found more pressing matters on her mind. Go with them, you must, Knight Sakura, Yoda declared, pointing his walking stick at Ayla. Needed, I sense, you will be. His sudden decision did not sit well with the council. Murmurs of shock and disapproval could already be heard whispering through their ranks. But none on those lofty seats dared to question the Grand Master's judgment, not allowed. Ayla did. In her mind, she was the worst possible choice. If worse truly came to blows and she was speak with Naruto or worse, to raise her saber against him for any reason dot 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 she just wasn't sure if she could do it. Master, are you sure this? Strong in the force you are. Trust yourself, you must. Yoda's nod was slow and brooked no argument. Ayla took both teeth between her lower lip, knowing she was helpless to broach the subject further yet wishing she could all the same. She had a terrible, terrible feeling about this dot 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 why couldn't any of the masters see it? Were they really that blind? No, such thoughts went against the Jedi Code itself, unbecoming of her. Surely they knew what they were doing. They must. How else could she believe in him? I understand, master. She relented at last. I will accompany Master qui -Gon and his apprentice, I will go. The wizened alien nodded. May the force be with you all. And with you, master, stiffly she forced a bow, struggling to project outward calm, to quell her swelling hopelessness in Kinsuyan. In reality, she had no way of knowing just how her presence on Naboo would change events. Naruto's interference had already sent ripples through the force, but she was truly unaware of what would happen once she set foot on Naboo. Indeed, Ala Sakura had no way of knowing. No way at all. It was night in the Naboo capsule city of Thede, the streets empty and silent save for the occasional sparking of broken battle droids and the whisper of the wind. Entire patrols had been wiped out in the blink of an eye. Destroyer droids lay splintered in the streets as though a giant hand had simply reached out and crushed them. There were no units in the area left to report. Their destruction had been so complete and abrupt that not even a single unit had escaped to tell of the tale. Newt Gunray himself wouldn't realize what happened until the next morning. By then it would already be too late. Flimsy, a dark figure murmured, noting softly to themselves as they stepped over the still spasming body of their latest victim. These droids were designed to overwhelm the enemy through sheer numbers. They were never meant for close combat. An interesting factoid to be sure. Exhaling in a long, suffering sigh they moved on, their footfalls disappearing back from whence they'd come. In the Queen's throne room, Newt Gunray and Rune Hako stood attentively before a looming hologram of Darth Sidious, blissfully unaware of their approaching doom. They were far too focused on the Dark Lord in all of his malevolent glory. The hologram filled the space at one end of the room, rising up before them menacingly. The dark cloaked figure at its center gestured, that single motion causing both Nemoidians to cringe. The queen is on her way to you, the Sith Lord intones softly. When she arrives, force her to sign the treaty. There was a momentary pause as the Nemoidians exchanged worried looks. Yes, my lord. Newt Gunray agreed reluctantly. Viceroy, is the plan secure? The dark figure in the hologram shimmered with movement. Yes, my lord. 
Dunray was on firmer ground here. We have taken the last pockets of resistance, consisting of mostly primitive life forms. We are now in complete control. The faceless speaker nodded. Good, I will see to it that things in the Senate stay as they are. I am sending Darth Maul to join you. He will deal with that shinobi menace and the Jedi. Yes, my lord. The words were litany. The hologram and Darth Sidious faded away. The Nemoidians stood where they were, frozen in place. A Sith Lord, here with us. Runehaka whispered in disbelief, and this time, Newt Gunray had nothing to say. Neither did the dark figure listening at the window. He'd heard all he needed to hear, enough for one night. Several nights, in fact. A reliable source had told him the Shinobi menace would come to this planet. And here he was, barely able to keep himself from trembling with laughter. This was just too good to be true. They'd been right, after all. He was here, rather he soon would be. And if the reports were anything to go by, he had become something of an infamy in this realm. Well, so too had he. He'd been content to stay here and deal with this Sith Lord himself. Those droids certainly weren't much of a challenge. But where was the fun in trying an opponent who was so obviously going to die when faced with the two of them? No, he would let him menace handle it. Just this once, a slow smile tugged at his lips as he dismounted the window and silently slipped away into the night. It seems you've made powerful enemies, Naruto. Heluo Nabuo. Naruto flung back his arms and laughed as he strode down the Konoha's ramp, uncaring for the laughter his outburst earned him from SHMI and the Twi'lek twins. It didn't matter, he was wearing this helmet. His voice was more than enough to convey the absolute joy he felt at being away from Coruscant and her urban sprawl, free and away from the Jedi, free to wreak complete and utter havoc on the Trade Federation, obliterate a small army of droids, and best of all, it paid for it. Granted, he'd be giving half of those credits to Django as recompensation for that stunt on Tatooine, but that was pointless semantics as far as the Jinchuriki was concerned. All that mattered was that they were here and not there. It's been a long time since I've seen you like this. SHMI smiled slightly as she took his hand, earning a chuckle from her dysfunctional husband. When was the last you smiled like that? Naruto turned to look at her, a clever retort ready to spring forth from his lips dot 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 and stopped. Just stopped. Once more, he was struck deaf and dumb by the beauty of his mate. Only this time, he truly had reason to be. SHMI had availed herself of his show since last he'd seen her, scrubbing herself clean of the blood and dirt she'd accumulated during his short-lived scuffle with Maul. But that wasn't what made him gape like a fish. Naruto, dear, you're staring. Hot damn, hot damn. For once Naruto and Kirama were of the same accord entirely. Within good reason, because SHMI Skywalker hadn't wasted any time adjusting at all. In that instant, the blonde's world shrank to a pinpoint of brilliance, reduced to just the two of them. He forgot all about HK-47. Vet and Seth, Sparky, even Anakin, his own son was thrust to the wayside before the sight of this gorgeous beauty standing only a few feet behind him. Realizing he was gawping, Naruto snapped his mouth shut, it closed with a harsh click. SHMI laughed. Gone were the plain clothes she'd once worn during her slavery to Watto. In their place stood a functional black body suit reminiscent of the one he wore beneath his armor even now. The question was, how the devil had she gotten her hands on it and how did it fit her? Had she made adjustments to one of his old outfits the hell am I worrying about that for now? He'd always considered having one made for SHMI on the off chance she ever decided to make bounty hunting her chosen profession. But until this very moment, he had never once considered what she might actually look in it. Until now, God himself couldn't have made crafted a more flawless figure in that outfit. Its orange and black trim did not glow in in the muggy morning light so much as they did glint to his susicent satisfaction. Snug in all the right places to every line and curve. And there, strapped firmly to her full hips by a belt, a pair of small, but menacing blasters. And her hair was down. Kami, he loved that. SHMI didn't look like a harmless housewife. She all but looked the part of a very dangerous woman. Were one to look at her eyes, they would have realized this was no act, this was one mother no man wanted to mess with. She might not be a Mandalorian like him, but he remembered she was a crack shot. Those blasters certainly weren't for show. So, SHMI asked at last, mistaking his silence for something else trepidation. How do I look? Well, Naruto whistled softly, hello beautiful, flatterer, the look she was shooting him could make most men melt, leave him all but weak need in other places. Did it have to do with her pregnancy? He wondered. She couldn't be that far along now, could she? Nah, he was probably just imagining things. Never one to back down from a challenge. The blonde took her hand in his and raised it to his lips, his mouth alighting lightly upon her knuckle. Remind me again, how much do I love you? 
S.H. Mai's smile grew another inch. Well, if you'd like, I could always refresh your memory. Nuam. Anakin blanched. He knew where this topic was going. Dad, that's gross. It's just the birds and the bees, son. Naruto laughed. I don't want to hear that. Well, you'll have to learn about it someday, Annie. Naruto didn't challenge her statement. Surely she knew he was grinning. Hirama probably was, too. Feels good, doesn't it, kid? Speak of the devil. I haven't laughed this hard since. Forever. Naruto mused softly to himself, suddenly serious. That had been a different kind of glee, soft, kind. Caring. This was different. He was in battle mode now. Righteous wrath and fury quickening pace and pulse, sending his heart hammering with each passing instant. Like the drums of a great hunt out for blood. All of his old instincts were resurfacing. His time as a bounty hunter as a shinobi had kicked in, memories of his brief apprenticeship to Django, and the brutal battles of the fourth shinobi war hardened his heart to the violence that was to come. Of course, he was also rather relieved to be away from that unbearable Gungan known as Jar Jar Binks. He'd never met a more clumsy entity in all of his life. Had he allowed that thing on board the Kanoha with them the poor creature wouldn't have lived to see his next sunrise. But there was something else here something he hadn't been expecting. Something pleasing. No. He was here. Naruto didn't know how, he didn't know when. But by some manner, the Zabrak had beaten him here. Sidious must have sent him. What a nice present. He could sense the brooding alien even without Senen mode. His aura was like a dark stain of rage amidst the tapestry of life. Here I am, menace. He seemed to say. Come and get me if you dare. Naruto, gentleman that he was, was more than happy to oblige him. But not yet. He'd preparations to make, precautions to take. He had sworn long ago, promised himself he would try his utmost to refrain from unnecessary acts of violence, but this was personal. Son of a bitch had tried to kill his woman, for crying out loud. No one did that. No one. Vengeance aside, there was just something about the outdoors that spoke to him. Perhaps the native marsh of this planet reminded him of the elemental nations, in a way. Whatever it was, there could be no substitute for the pure high he felt as he contemplated Maul's imminent dismemberment. The thought of carving the Zabrak into bloody chunks sent a small, maddened giggle from his lips. Oh, he was going to enjoy this. Once he found that fool, he would make him see the true terror of the Shinobi menace. All of his being would go towards terminating that fool. It would not be a slow death. He wanted Maul to suffer, to experience that same despair he'd felt when he'd seen SHMI sprawled out on the sands. Oh, he was going to enjoy this so much. Oh dad, you were laughing again. Anakin deadpanned. I was, wasn't I? Naruto tittered softy, contenting himself to a small sigh as he disengaged himself from his wife and began his weapons check. Now then dot 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 let's get down to business. He cackled devilishly, rubbing palms of his gloved hands together in gleeful anticipation of the chaos to come. Blasters. Check. Lightsaber. Check. Chakra. Check. Armor. Check. Complete and total battery. Check. His neck popped with a deafening crack broad shoulders rolling beneath the weight of the small armory he'd strapped onto his personage. Had anyone else thought to use such weaponry, it would have been considered excess. But Naruto, this was juiced enough. This planet was about to become a droid graveyard. He'd absolutely no fear of holding back against a pile of cold, unfeeling durasteel. Speaking of cold and unfeeling, HK-47 tilted its head, regarding his master in the swamp into which their vessel had landed. Are there meatbags to kill here, master? Oh yes. The blonde spun around, his eyes glowing through the helm. If by meatbags you mean fellow droids, there will be plenty. The droids' photoreceptors seem to visibly brighten. I gleefully anticipate the slaughter. Naruto gave a bark of amusement. Took the words right out of my mouth. Admit it. Kurama snickered alongside him. You're just giddy because you blue-balled the council. Damn right he was. It had been the ultimate high for the menace standing before twelve of the most powerful men and women in existence and pinning them to the walls like a bunch of hapless children. The one thing that had kept him from slaughtering each and every one of them had been thrice, one Anakin, two SHMI, three and ironically, Ayla, whose own morals notwithstanding. He'd been dangerous enough at the time to know he could easily take on an entire temple of Jedi and emerge with only a few minor injuries. But what would Isla, as a comrade, think of him? More importantly, what would his family? Murdering the council wouldn't have righted their wrongs, nor would it have redressed what they owed him. It might have made him feel damn good perhaps, obliterating their worthless little lives one by one dot 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 but at what cost? He had a kid to think about now. There could be no more of this inane gung-ho slaughter whomever looked at him crossways, not after that vision. 
Anakin looked up to him as his son. Anything he himself did, the boy would likely emulate. Did Naruto want his only progeny to be a mass murderer, a killer for hire like himself? No, hell no. He would see this and think that he too could do the same. He wasn't willing to expose Annie to that kind violence just, hence the reason he brought him here. This would be the boy's first true lesson. Droids did not feel pain, nor did they bleed. They would be a perfect example with little to no risk. If his only child managed to decimate a few walking stick figures, it'd make for fine practice. Well, the boy would have worshipped you either way, came the reply, assuming he doesn't already after that awesome display. As for your woman surely a simple slaughter wouldn't be enough to sway her feelings for you. Perhaps not. But still, Yoda damn, if I hadn't been using a clone, he would have broken our spine with that force push. What did you expect from the Grand Master himself? You should be grateful most Jedi can't do that to us. I know, right. What I wouldn't give for a challenge in this world. Dad, sensing his father's turmoil, Anakin gulped again. Perceptive kid, this one. Yes, son. You seem kinda excited. Of course I am. Naruto suddenly sobered at his son's words, wisely choosing not to give voice to his own thoughts. For one, we're off Coruscant. Second, I'm getting paid. Third, I finally get to teach you. You're really going to teach me. Why did he still feel so insecure about this? Of course I am. His progenitor replied. The force, chakra, everything. In fact, I think it's high time for your first lesson. What? Close your eyes. Naruto instructed, unruffled by the question. Trust your instincts, your feelings. Then tell me, what do you feel? Reluctantly, Anakin did just that. His world fell away. He couldn't sense droids of course, no force user no matter how masterful could. But he did sense Maul, the Sith apprentice could be felt as a pit of boiling rage and hatred halfway across the world. The longer he looked at it the more aware it became of him. He could feel its eyes staring down at him, boring into his very soul. It laughed at him then, telling him his father would die today with his mother, promising pain and suffering and so much agony, that the boy could scarcely comprehend it. He will share their fate, little one. Anakin severed the contact with a hiss, his face pale. There's someone out there. He murmured almost to himself with a shudder. He hadn't realized he'd spoken aloud until his father congratulated him. As someone dark. Correct? The bounty hunter sounded pleasantly surprised behind his helm. How far would you say he is from our position? A couple hundred miles. That's my boy. Naruto laughed, ruffling his hair with a hand. See, you're learning already. It's not a matter of questioning your judgment. You just need to trust your heart. I've always done that, and it's served me well and true. Now try again. See if you can sense me while I'm hiding my presence. It'll be a good lesson in stealth. His father was right. It was far easier to use his feelings to use the admiration and respect he'd had for his progenitor to suss him out. The power came to him naturally, flowing through him like a conduit, making him its vessel. Then there, he could see his father through the force. Do you see me? The voice seemed to echo in the depths of his mind. I do. Naruto shone like a second sun behind his eyes, radiating warmth and amusement into the force. There was strength here, pride and anger, albeit a righteous one. He felt so different from the Jedi, who walled off their emotions in the Sith, who radiated rage and fury like a burning durasteel oven. His was a comfortable medium, he wasn't afraid of his emotions, but neither was he a slave to them. He fought for what he believed in and didn't give a damn about what others thought. This was what a hero should be. Someone right, strong, a true pillar of justice. This was what he wanted to be. Anakin was granted the briefest of visions just then, a grand image of himself, nearly a deity older, looking so much like his father and mother, tall and proud. And yet, there was a terrible sense of sadness about him. He tried to chase the vision but it deserted him before he could suss it out, leaving him sensing the brilliant supernova that was his father. He could sense his mother as well, feel the unborn child inside her, the tiny life that would one day become that of his little sister, and he marveled at it. Lara, that was what SHMI wanted to name her. There beside the three of them, that and Set registered as a pair of lights, but even with the Twi'lek twins and his mother combined, they failed to outshine the light that was his father. What was that? And then, that light winked out. Anakin started in surprise, but managed to latch onto that sense of nostalgia, tracing his father back to what he'd felt. There, he could still sense him, despite the attempts he'd made to try and hide himself. The boy grinned, quietly pleased by his triumph. But there, on the edges of his senses, there's someone else. Abruptly, his face brightened. Padme, he would have said more, had not the sleek, streamlined hull of the Queen's spaceship chose that very instant cut through the atmosphere above them. 
a pall fell over his little family. That was, SHMI began, very, that demurred with a shake of her head. Foolish, Set seemed to finch her sister's thoughts. Naruto was in complete agreement with his wife and the twins. Anakin was left to wonder just why they seemed so angry. His father's gaze snapped upward, T-shaped visor quietly following the descending spacecraft as it slipped through the air, repulsors whining. Within seconds it had settled just beside their craft. Beneath Naruto's helm, a soft hiss could be heard just under the visor. Indeed, Padme was present upon the vessel. But so too were three Jedi. He'd though himself rid of them for the time being. Apparently not. He'd been in such a hurry to leave Coruscant behind he hadn't bothered to check his comlink. To learn that the queen herself blatantly obvious there had elected to return to her homeworld to fight for her cause. Apparently, she'd taken some Jedi along as an extra precaution. Why am I not surprised? He hissed aloud, silently seething at the sheer stupidity of this decision. The ramp slid down whilst he spoke, ending any further discussion. As one they disembarked at Medalla and her handmaidens. The Jedi Knights with R2-D2, Rick Oli and several other pilots and finally a handful of Naboo guards, all clustered uneasily in the misty silence. They seemed to be waiting for something. His response, perhaps. Well then, he'd be all too happy to oblige them. Shall I shoot the meatbags, master? HK-47 inquired. Well, SHMI shot him a scathing glance. W what? Naruto sweated up. I was just joking, honey. Joking. Innocence, right. In that case, that was when he saw Qui Gon. All his playful demeanor dropped away, replaced by a dangerous frown. Though he was able to detect Jedi, he wasn't all that familiar with distinguishing them. Emotionless scumbags all started to look the same to him after a while. You the hunter's voice was like an amplified whisper. If a knife could talk, this would be what it sounded like. He pointed one long finger at Qui Gon. Why are you here? As unlikely as it may seem, we're to assist you. Qui Gon replied, choosing that moment to shatter the silence. Obi Wan didn't take kindly to that. But, Master, be silent, my young Padawan. Jin snapped tersely. Though the council might wish it otherwise, we are not here to start a war we cannot win. He caught Naruto's gaze and held it, thereby earning a slight nod from the blonde in recompense for his temerity. Master Windu specifically said. His master's gaze was positively scathing. So too was his reply. You still have much to learn, my young Padawan. Not everyone is an enemy as deemed by the council. Wow. Naruto exhaled a long-suffering sigh. Seriously, Obi-Wan. Wow. Just kill all the fun. Put the fun in camps, why don't you? A damn fun Nazi. Did you just do what I think you did? Kinda obvious by now, ain't it? SHMI half expected him to follow with ass or some such. When he did not, it was left for the aging master to continue. I do not know the metaphor of which you draw. qui -Gon continued. But regardless, we must set aside the quarrels of our houses and unite to face this threat. We will leave the droid army to you. All I ask in return is that you leave the Sith to the three of us. You mean Maul? Naruto countered. Yeah, no. I what? I said no. The blonde continued. He's mine. I hate to say it actually, wait. Though his face could not be seen behind the helmet, his words dripped with venom. I'd love to say it. You're in way over your head at the moment. In other words, you won't stand a chance. You may be one of the greatest duelists I've fought, but let's face it, Maul's better than you. He's younger, faster, stronger. You might have more skill than him as of yet, but if he somehow separates you from your dear student over there and gets you alone dot 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 it's over. You will die. Do you understand? A muscle jumped in Qui Gon's jaw. Are you implying that you're willing to work with us? Work with you? Naruto scoffed. No. Slaughter the hell out of that damned horn boy. Yes. And as for the rest of you, go home, Kittis. Naruto sighed, waving his hand in a shooing gesture. This is no place for you. Any of you. He considered using Shinra Tensei to just shove them right back up the ramp. But something made him reconsider at the very last instant. Why waste the energy on them? He'd be needing every bit of it to demolish the Trade Federation. On second thought, fuck it. Go ahead and get yourselves killed. Just make sure our dear Padney doesn't get caught up in it, you know. I can't get paid if she's dead. Ma boy can't grow up to marry her if she's dead, either. Does that work? A small squeak rose from somewhere amidst the line of handmaidens. Hirama cackled. You sly devil. Thanks. Naruto beamed. I try. Dad. Anakin groaned, his face aflush with embarrassment. Are you going to do this right now? In front of everybody. What? Naruto shrugged, rolling his armored shoulders. You did say you loved her, right? I can't believe you just did that. Right? Then. Tousling his heir's hair, Naruto stepped forward. Now that we've cleared that speed bump you might as well tell me, why are you here, your majesty? Anakin, hearing his father's words, studied the group surreptitiously, wondering just what his father meant by that. 
Wasn't it obvious why she was here? I wish to reclaim my planet. The queen replied stoically. She stood wrapped in her soft robes, silent and implacable in the midst of her handmaidens. Padme, Irti and Rabe had changed from their crimson hooded cloaks into more functional trousers, tunics, boots, and long-waisted overcoats, and there were blasters strapped to their waists. The boy had never seen Padme like this, and he found himself wondering how good of a fighter she really was. As if realizing what he was thinking, SHMI gave him a gentle nudge toward Padme. Anakin flushed anew. Did his parents enjoy making him this uncomfortable? Amidst this, the queen continued. We are here too. I wasn't talking to you, woman. Naruto's helmeted gaze resolutely ignored her slitting instead across her handmaidens, alighting upon Padme. I was talking to the queen. I think it's high time you let everyone in on your little secret. Don't you think dot 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 your highness? There was a silence. Anakin's jaw dropped. Padme was the queen. You are. Correct, menace. Padme spoke slowly, keenly aware of everyone's eyes upon her. I am she. Back to your mother now. Naruto shooed his son towards the ship. We have business to discuss. But, dad. Great. Naruto clapped his hands together. Now, I'll leave you lot to whatever it is you have planned. Just stay out of my way. And keep that damned Gungan away from me before I chop off his head for good. HK. A word had the droid following him at a wave, its long legs creaking slightly. Oh, I do hope we can begin soon. The droid mused aloud. My trigger finger is beginning to itch. I'm getting to that. He replied. But first, we'll need to. A hand closed around his wrist, stopping him cold. A word, Naruto. The blonde paused in his pace and cocked his head aside, turning his head to confront the one who had dared touch him. He was momentarily alarmed to find himself face to face with a pair of familiar brown, chocolate-colored eyes, said eyes belonging to a certain Twi'lek. Oila, she was looking right at him, her heart-shaped face contrived with something akin to sorrow. They stared at one another for a long moment, unable to try and form the words that needed to be said. At last, Naruto removed his helmet, exposing his whiskered face to the world once more as he tucked the bucket helm under his arm. So you're the third. He mused softly, trying his best to conceal his surprise. Qui-Gon had mentioned that there were three of them. Was there something you wanted? Ala seemed to squirm beneath his gaze she'd become extremely nervous since their last meeting. Now she wasn't sure what if anything should be said to him. Finally, she mustered up her resolve and spoke. I was wondering if we could have that talk. I suppose now's as good a time as any. Come with me. The bounty hunter gestured for her to follow him back to the ship where SHMI and the others awaited his arrival. Isla at once recognized his son, Anakin, that sandy blonde hair and boyish grin were hard to forget. The boy offered a tentative smile once he saw her approach. The women, however, she did not recognize. There were three of them, two Twi'lek sisters who seemed avidly interested in meeting her, and a beautiful brunette who affected a small smile of her own at Naruto's return. Isla didn't make the connection until he kissed her, looping an arm round her waist to draw her title to him, body to body. I'd like you to meet my wife, SHMI. He introduced, upon pulling away. Oh, and these two are vet and set. I take it you haven't met. Isla didn't know how to reconcile her feelings, so lost was she, that her mouth barely managed to mumble a greeting to the twins. Was she actually, jealous? But no, she was still struggling to decide what exactly she felt for the blonde but to see his made up close put a serious dent in her courage not to mention her own heart. SHMI didn't seem the least bit baffled by her presence if anything she seemed dot 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 glad. So you're Isla, then? The brunette smiled softly. Naruto's told me all about you. Nothing bad I hope. The Twi'lek had to force a smile of her own. Not at all. SHMI shook her head. You're one of the few Jedi he'd actually trust his back to, after all. Don't say it like that. Naruto growled, but the words were without rancor. You'll give her a big head. The Twi'lek flushed, her mind simultaneously flooded with a myriad mix of humility and shame. It was true, she had encountered Naruto many a time before even cooperated with him on occasion during her sojourns throughout the galaxy in service to the Order. He was a good man to have, and a fine warrior in a fight. That was all. She'd tried to tell herself the very same thing on multiple occasions. Then why couldn't she purge this dark heat from her heart and be done with it? By the Force, I can't be falling for him. I just can't. Jedi are not allowed to love. Such thoughts were unbecoming of her. And yet try as she might, she could not bring herself to drive them from her head. So, Naruto asked. You wanted to say something. Ayla took a deep breath, steeled herself, and began to speak. Naruto on behalf of the Jedi Council, I would like to personally extend my apologies for what happened yesterday. A white lie the council probably wasn't the least bit sorry for what they'd done but she felt she needed to do something to bridge this ever-growing gulf between them. 
But more than that, Naruto was a near, dear friend to her, one who'd saved her life more times than she cared to count. At the very least deserve the benefit of the doubt. I would also like to apologize for failing to do anything about it. She continued, bowing low. I'm so sorry. Had I known that was your son, I. Naruto's eyebrows shot up. He was surprised to see her fate truly worked in mysterious ways but to hear this. Her abrupt apology baffled him. It also incensed him. The hell was she apologizing for? It wasn't as though she'd been the one to bring Anakin to the temple. And she was apologizing for it. By the nine. Apology not accepted. What? I already told you. You had nothing to do with this. Naruto sighed. Brushing her concerns aside with a flippant flick to her smooth forehead. Why are you always so damn apologetic for things you didn't do eh? Isla's leku curled in agitation as she took her lower lip between her teeth. She couldn't believe this from him. It had taken her hours to build up the nerve to speak with him and now that she finally did dot 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 this happened. A rare touch of anger coiled across her face, twisting her small mouth into a scowl. Here she was trying to apologize to him, and he refused it, claiming it wasn't her fault. How dare he? She wanted to apologize. Didn't he see that? Or was he really such a stellar individual as to not allow her the burden of blame? You, huh? Naruto cocked his head aside, blue eyes narrow. You're looking awfully red, insufferable buffoon. The shinobi menace rocked back in surprise. Why the hell are you so pissed? Oh, you want to know? Ayla snapped. Shall I start at the A's and work down the list of how many times I owe you? And you won't even allow me a single chance to apologize. To thank you for all that you've said and done on my behalf. Is that so wrong? Is it? She stared at him. The hurt unconcealed on her face, surprised to find tears brimming in her eyes, threatening to spill over at the slightest provocation. Naruto gazed at her in disbelief, his deadpan barely concealed. What this really that important to her? Gods, just kiss her and make it better already. What? Naruto nearly facepalmed on the spot. No, she's a good friend. Besides, SH Mai is standing right there. And, and, and that's it for now. You sir, are such a killjoy. Naruto had no reply to that. All right, all right. He sighed, scratching at the back of his head. If it means that much to you, then I forgive you for. Whatever it is you feel you did wrong. You've been a good friend, Ayla. But I won't be forgiving the council, not anytime soon. Not after what they've done. I hope you can understand that. Ayla could. She knew the masters might have been foolish, but surely they would learn from their mistake. In the meantime, she was more than content to have reaffirmed Naruto's faith in her. It truly did lighten her soul. I will try. She conceded, sniffling, scrubbing at her face with the back of a hand. I'm sorry if I grew angry with you. It is unbecoming of a Jedi. You're better than them, you know. Oh, not this again. Naruto had more than once tried to sway her away from the Jedi, citing just how flawed their logic was in some such. She knew that the Order did have its flaws, but Ayla still firmly believed such mistakes could be better corrected from within than without. I'm flattered that you think so, but I wish to remain with them. Naruto shrugged, placing one hand upon her shoulder. Suit yourself. Just don't let them brainwash you, all right. No promises, she retorted wryly, shaking of his arm. S.H. Mai's laughter broke the moment. You really do care for him, don't you? Her face was devoid of even the slightest scorn. She simply seemed amazed with Ayla's resolve. I thought Jedi weren't allowed to love. We aren't. I see. His wife seemed to consider her answer for a moment. Then perhaps you should consider what he said. Ayla had nothing to say to that. Instead she bowed once more. Thank you for your time. She said. For all our sakes, I truly hope you know what you're doing. With that said, she turned and walked away. She does care about you. SHMI whispered in his ear the moment the Twi'lek was out of earshot. She's a fine ally, Naruto reaffirmed. And someday, I hope to be something more. A small part of Isla thought as she walked away, her ears still ringing with his final words. Her decision now finally made. But the only question is, how? Hui Gon and Obi Wan stood together some distance away. The Jedi still weren't speaking to each other, or only barely so. Their words on the journey out from Coruscant had been reserved almost exclusively for others. The hard feelings caused by qui -Gon's bid to train Anakin, and now his alliance with Naruto, did not soften. His master had tried to talk to him once aboard the Queen's ship, just to say he was sorry this had happened, but the younger Jedi had brushed him off. Now, though, Obi-Wan was beginning to feel uncomfortable with the situation. He had been close with qui -Gon for too long to let a momentary disagreement put an end to twenty-odd years of friendship. Qui Gon was like a father to him, the only father he knew. He was angry that the Jedi Master would dismiss him so abruptly in favor of working with the Shinobi menace, but he realized, too, the depth of Qui Gon's passion when he believed in something. 
training Anakin Skywalker was a cause Qui-Gon had championed only briefly, and though the boy's father had forbid it, Obi-Wan had witnessed firsthand the extent of his master's resolve. He'd only done so because he had believed in the boy's destiny, and now despite the latter's animosity he was willing to work with him, for the sake of the greater good. Obi-Wan understood now, who could say, perhaps this time Qui-Gon was right in this instance, perhaps Naruto's cause was worth fighting for after all. I've been thinking as of late, Qui-Gon announced suddenly, keeping his voice low, his eyes directed toward the others. We are treading on dangerous ground here. If the queen truly intends to use Naruto fight a war for her we cannot become involved. Nor can Isla, not even in her efforts to persuade the Gungans to join with the Nabu against the Federation. If that is what she intends by coming here, the Jedi have no authority to take sides. But we do have authority to protect the queen, Obi-Wan pointed out. Qui-Gon's eyes shifted to find him. It is a fine line we walk, then. Master, Obi-Wan said, turning to face him now. I behaved badly back there, on Coruscant as well, and I am embarrassed. I meant no disrespect to you. I do not wish to be difficult in the matter of the menace. Nor have you been, the older Jedi replied, a faint smile reappearing. You have been honest with me thus far. Honesty is never wrong. I did not lie when I told the council you were ready. You are, truly, I have taught you all I can. You will be a great Jedi, my young Padawan. I know you will make me proud. They gripped hands impulsively, and as quickly as that, the breach had opened between them was closed. I see you've reconciled your differences. Both men turned to find Isla Secura striding towards them, a pleased smile written across her dark blue features. She slowed to a halt only a few feet away, practically radiating determination into the Force. It was a sharp contrast to the indecisive mess she'd been only a few moments before. What could have happened to her in so short a time? Obi-Wan wondered. Qui-Gon already knew, just as he knew better than to make any old mention of it aloud, lest he be betray the knowledge. In the end, he didn't have to. You seem to have done the same. Obi-Wan admitted. Indeed. Isla smiled softly, mysteriously. I've finally found someone worth fighting for. Neither Jedi dared to question her on her choice of words, nor the fact that she'd said someone instead of something. The senior Sith Lord appeared in a shimmer of robes and shadows as his protege, and the Nemoidians walked slowly down the corridor leading from the throne room back to the plaza. We have sent out our patrols, Newt Gunray said, concluding his report to the ominous figure in the projection. We have already located their starships in the swamp. It won't be long before we have them in hand, my lord, and the patrol that was mysteriously destroyed last night. I am afraid we still haven't cog at the culprit, Millord. Dar Sidious was silent. For a moment, Newt Gunray was afraid he hadn't been heard. This is an unexpected move for the Queen. The Sith Lord said at last, it is too aggressive. I suspect outside forces are at work in and amongst her people. Lord Maul, be mindful. Yes, Master. The Odor Sith growled softly, yellow eyes gleaming. Be patient, Darth Sidious purred, head lowered in cowled shadows, hands folded into black robes. Let them make the first move. In silence, Darth Maul and the Nemoidians continued on as the hologram slowly faded away. Sometime later, I can't believe that worked. Naruto whispered to Qui-Gon as the Gungans cheered and hooted around them. Who would have thought Padme was such a skilled speaker? The older Jedi smiled, surveying the Gungan army emerging from the trees. You doubted her. The Shinobi menace exhaled heavily. No, it's just, ever since you lot landed on my planet three days ago, I find myself learning to expect the unexpected. His gaze traveled to Ayla, conversing with Vet and Set. Qui-Gon said nothing. He knew Naruto spoke not of the unlikely Gungan, Nabu alliance but of the Twi'lek Jedi herself. Shit, surprising me like that back there she's almost as bad as you. Am I forgiven, then? For now, Naruto was facing him now, Rinnegan eyes boring into his very soul. But I swear to God, if you ever do that again, rest assured, I won't. I hope for your sake, that you don't. The blonde seethed, turning his gaze toward the forest canopy. But enough about that it's time for my debut. Naturally, Qui-Gon followed the rogue hunter's gaze only to find Naruto staring miles upward. His attention fixated upon the droid control ship looming high, high, high overheads beyond the atmosphere. Almost on cue, the blonde raised a hand and the distant speck seemed to impossible veer to the right. He didn't. The Jedi's gaze snapped back toward the blonde, only to find him a vein throbbing in his forehead, his eyes narrow and intent upon that distant speck. Obi-Wan and Isla had felt it as well. Their attention now remained rooted on the horizon, whilst Qui-Gon's fixated upon the blonde, knowing and dreading what he'd just seen. Naruto had just moved the control ship with his mind. Five seconds passed, nothing was said. Then the blonde began to laugh. It was a deep, throaty sound, capturing the attention of all. 
The force is a powerful thing, my friend. Baruto began slowly, his words strained with exertion. You yourself know that. I could easily rip that pesky little thing from the sky and send it crashing down to the planet in a blaze of fiery glory. But if I'd done that, we'd have no alliance between the Gungans and Nabu, would we? So I thought it appropriate to wait. But now now, his eyes flew wide, Rinnegan bulging as he reached into his power, utilizing the othwardly prowess of the Rinnegan, melding it with that of the Force. A low hiss left his lips. Now it's time for war. He reached up with invisible fingers and latched onto the massive U that was the ship, and with a supreme effort of will yanked. Hard. Suddenly, that distant speck didn't seem so distant anymore to qui -Gon. It began to grow. Within a heartbeat it resembled speck began to grow larger, then larger, and larger still. Gungan and Nabu alike peered upward as that flaming streak grew to obscene proportions, hurtling across the sky like a great cataclysm, burning the skies a brutal shade of red. It soared past them with the shriek of superheated metal, its lumbering descent sending it hurtling towards a nearby Mointane, guided through will alone. By the force, Isla murmured, Is he really? A distant earthquake heralded its landing. Dad did that. Anakin gawped at the rising cloud of smoke. SHMI smiled close at hand. Darling, you never cease to amaze me. There you go. The blonde gasped, rippling violet fading back to blue. One grounded bird, ripe for the picking. I hope you don't expect any more godly feats after this. I'm going to be a bit gassed after that no more Rinnegan for the next five minutes. But, I'm pretty sure the impact crushed the engines and screwed him over. Control ship won't be able to leave that atmosphere now it should be easy pickings once their starfighters get airborne and knock out that shield. You know. You planned this. It was not a question. Of course I did. Naruto replied with a sly smile. I'd originally intended to yank it down to earth and storm it myself but you've saved me a great deal of trouble. Now, if Newt Gunry has got half a brain, which clearly he doesn't, he'll be massing most of his droids as we speak rallying them at this location. Guess it's time to see how strong this native army really is. But just in case, a crossing of his fingers summoned a gigantic plume of smoke. When it cleared, a hundred armored clones stood before them. The blonde barked a word and they snapped to rigid attention, saluting as one. All right, men. Naruto snapped. You know your orders. Storm the city of Thede and create as much confusion as possible. Leave Maul to myself and the Jedi. Search and destroy. Search and destroy. I expect a pile of scrap metal at my feet by this afternoon. Do you understand? Yes, sir. A golden flash tore through the clearing and then they were gone. A series of steaming footprints all that remained to suggest they'd ever existed. qui -Gon balked at the sight. How do you do that? Not only had he summoned a horde of clones, but they'd vanished in an instant. Oh that. Naruto smiled. It's a little thing I like to call wait for it a secret, comprendo. Now get over here. Ayla, Kinobi, you too. Grab tight and don't let go. Not even for an instant. The blonde bit each Jedi draw close, forcing them each to grab a fistful of the cloak worn over his armor, unknowingly securing themselves for what was to come. Please keep all arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times. With that final word the last Shinobi exhaled a long-lasting laugh, reached up and slipped on his helmet. A click of his tongue activated the built-in com link. SHMI, Annie prepped the ship and wait for my signal. Daddy's going hunting. With a sharp TC chin, they vanished. In the Feed Palace throne room, Darth Sidious loomed like an angry specter in hologram form before Darth Maul. Battle droid commander OOM9. And the Nemoidians, smooth and silky, his voice oozed through the shadowy ether, making himself heard throughout the entire room as though he were actually present. Our young menace surprises even me. He whispered thoughtfully, hidden within his dark robes. I had not expected such mastery of the Force in one so young. Beyond them the charred mountain range that marked the final resting place of the droid control ship could be seen. Still somehow functional despite its hull having been charred to almost nothingness its shields holding at a mere 50%. By some unknown grace those electronics responsible for the functionality of the droid army still operated, albeit at less than peak percent. This was it everyone realized, the end game. They stood on the press eyepiece of victory or complete defeat. The winner would be he who acted first. W we are sending all available units into battle at the crash site to meet this army of hers. Newt Gunray offered quickly. It appears to be assembling at the edge of the swamp. Primitives, my lord nothing better. We do not expect much resistance. I am increasing security at all Nabu detention camps. OOM9 intoned. Darth Maul glared at nothing, then shook his horned head. I feel there is more to this than we know, master. The three Jedi may be using the queen for their own purposes. The Jedi cannot become involved. Darth Sidious soothed, hands spreading in a placating motion. They can only protect the queen. 
Even Qui-Gon Jinn cannot break that covenant. This will work to our advantage. And the menace. Darth Maul snorted, anxious to get on with it. He will be no match for you, my apprentice. Once more the Dark Lord reassured him. You have grown by leaps and bounds since your first bot. His power will be but a minor inconvenience at the worst. I have your approval to proxy, then, my lord. Newt Gunray asked, hesitantly avoiding the younger Sith's mad eyes. Proceed. Darth Sidious ordered softly. Wipe them out, Viceroy. All of them. He spoke no further as a flying foot burst through the nearby window and all hell broke loose. Dynamic. Entry. Darth Maul had just enough time to blink before a booted foot appeared out of nowhere to plow headlong into his face. The flying dropkick proved nothing short of spectacular. One moment the shinobi menace wasn't there. The next he was, his jetpack carrying him forward in a flying lunge that left the Sith assassin tumbling end over end across the throne room. He was up in an instant, snarling his fury. But the sheer ferocity of the assault had left him reeling, the world spinning, his mind momentarily insensate whilst he struggled to reclaim his bearings. In that instant a lightsaber ignited, nearly deafening in its intensity. Newt Gunray and Rune Hako screamed, but those screams were each cut short by a muted thud, accompanied by the dull thump of their bodies now flopping to the floor in an unconxious heap. Maul's fury only grew. Whomever had broken to the throne room clearly had more than enough skill to knock out a pair of frightened Nimoidanes. To be honest, being blind like this was beginning to make him feel more than a touch uncomfortable. OOM9 discharged his blaster once, twice, three times. On the third shot the deadly hum of a lightsaber ended his short-lived shooting spree. All the while Maul was cursing himself for his own stupidity. He'd been a fool to let his guard down. If the menace was able to drag a ship out of orbit, then he was certainly capable of sneaking in undetected. And then just when his vision had finally begun to clear an invisible hand ripped through his weakened defenses and closed around his throat. Urk, the Zabrak managed the startled gasp as his back greeted the wall's sharpened shards of a durasteel sculpture bit into his back before he finally ripped himself free. Oh, Maul bristled as a furious howl ripped through his ears, accompanied by the earth-shattering crack of in the blonde's landing. You have no idea how good that felt, how cathartic. It's a damned good thing I put that Horatian seal on you back on Tatooine. You made this wa I too easy. Dreading what he might find, the apprentice raised his gaze and found himself face to face with the devil himself. Arudo's grin was positively demonic behind the jadden glow of his lightsaber. Hello, horn boy. His grin grew another inch. Miss me. For all his training, the Zabrak actually gulped. He was beginning to sorely regret this course of action. Not only did the Shinobi menace stand before him, but he stood flanked by Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Isla Secura, three Jedi and one bounty hunter. He was beginning to like these odds less and less. With a force like this facing him, death was a very real possibility. Not that he feared it, but then again, neither was he a fool to just throw his life away. He had to find some way to escape this Jedi death trap before they grew tired of standing there, and finally came to face him. So at last we meet, face to face. When the hologram of Darth Sidious spoke a new Maul honestly didn't expect anyone to be fool enough to actually turn their head and look at his master. Fortunately for him, someone did just that. There, the Sith apprentice seized on the opportunity afforded him by his master, ripping OOM9's broken body and hurtling it across the room at Obi-Wan forcing him into a haphazard block. That was all it took. For him to leap up, roll past Naruto's blade descending blade, ignite his own, and drive the crimson shaft of his saber deep into the Padawan's thigh. He reveled in the boy's cry of pain, drank deep of his fear and terror with delight before scything the second blade toward his head. Kenobi, to his credit, did not scream. He simply raised his blade and parried, turning what might have been a decapitating stroke into an angry furrow across his cheek. Maul hissed his fury at the failed kill and fought into a spiral, bringing his other blade, extracting it from the Padawan's wound as he sought the kill. But the moment was already lost even as he tried to end the student. His master was there, batting his blade aside with a strong armed block, forcing him to divert his attention to the older Jedi as the other two advanced upon him. In the same instant, Darth Maul reached around and force choked Isla Secura, ripping the Twi'lek from her feet before she could cut him down and flinging her against the wall with bone-jarring force. She hung there as he looked on, her body lolling loosely with unconsciousness. Sadly, he had no time to savor the supposed kill. Just to be certain, he flicked her at the now broken window hurling Isla to her certain demise miles below on the Permacrete courtyard. Or so he'd thought. Qui-Gon battered through his guard to score an angry red line against the Zabrak's chest, lessening the strength of Maul's telekinetic throw seconds before it could reach terminal velocity. 
Naruto aborted his attack seconds later, sacrificing precious time and fuel from his jetpack to leap upwards and catch her in midair. He alighted effortlessly upon the nearby throne and lowered her to the floor, checked her pulse and earned a weak nod from the Twi'lek, all in the time it took for Maul to breathe. Once more, curse this destroyer of fate for depriving him of a potential kill. His reprieve was over now, he knew it, deep in the depths of his blackened heart. The real battle began now, neither of these men would make the same mistakes. What transpired in the next 30 seconds would decide the fate of Nabu. But there was a fury in the blonde's eyes, and that frightened Maul. Now, I'm really going to enjoy this. He ripped his helmet free with one hand, exposing eyes of deadly, rippling violent. I was thinking about killing you quickly, but now, I've changed my mind. I am going to tear you apart piece by piece. The entire room seemed to buckle around in response as he spoke. It was as if he'd become a conduit for death itself. In the corner of the room, Sidious's hologram smiled in dark amusement. Such strength, such hate. I've never felt anything like this before. We take him together. Hui Gon warned, his voice cutting through the haze. Naruto looked as though he were about to protest, but, at the last instant, stilled himself. Those invisible energies swirling around him began to dissipate, culminating instead in a single gesture. An errant flick of that wrist called Isla's blade to his hand, its pallid blue glow joining the deep, verdant green of his own. There was a moment of silence as the blonde weighed his new weapon, as Qui Gon shifted his stance and prepared himself, readying his body and mind, opening himself to the force. Fine. Then they lunged. Naruto and Qui Gon leapt at him as one, their blades meeting his with a shower of sparks driving the Sith apprentice back with the sheer momentum of their simultaneous strike. Still, Maul rather liked these odds. He could certainly handle an aging Jedi and an upstart bounty hunter, he told himself. These fools had handed him victory on a silver platter. Several blocks later swiftly disavailed him of that opinion. The Jedi and the Hunter weren't fighting Fury with Fury as he'd so suspected. They were eerily calm, composed, even. When qui -Gon cut high Naruto cut low. When Naruto stabbed, the older Jedi made use of his greater experience and slashed. When Maul sought to retreat, they worked to drive him into a corner. He was swiftly seeing his mistake in not eliminating the master what qui -Gon might be lacking in stamina. He more than made up for in ferocity and determination. Together they pressed the attack, driving him from the throne room and into the corridors leading the plaza. He knew that if they continued in his form, he would lose not only the battle, but his life as well. The tide needed to turn. Now, maintaining his defense, he glanced from one foe to the other. The hunter was immune to all techniques of the force, his unusual density in the fabric of life preventing him from behind harm. What's more, he had an unbelievable well of stamina, Pao's yet untapped in this duel. Something was sustaining him, keeping his energy from flagging. But not Qui Gon. The Jedi had only the Force to sustain him, and the Force could do so much. Even now Maul could see sweat beating on his brow as he struggled to maintain Naruto's furious pace. Age had caught up to him, he cowled. Whirling in place, he thrust the hilt of his saber into Qui Gon's chin, momentarily staggering the older Jedi. Once more the Zabrak twirled, this time seeking to plunge his blade deep into the man's stomach. Naruto was suddenly there, overextending his left saber in a desperate attempt to keep his old friend from losing his life. Using that same hand, he thrust qui -Gon backwards with the force and out of harm's way. His tactic proved worked but it left him off kilter and unbalanced, vulnerable to the Sith's counterattack. There, Maul whirled, planting a booted footed in the blonde's midsection then stabbing at his unprotected face. Naruto's crush gaunt dropped Ayla's lightsaber and shot upward, closing around the deadly beam, halting it mere millimeters from his face. Maul roared his triumph and pushed down, fighting against the shinobi menace's strength in a contest of his own. So close, just a little more. With the other Jedi stunned, victory would at long last be his. His hated rival vanquished. Does it make you angry? He mocked, pressing his advantage, struggling to drive the blade throg the blonde's eye. Then I hurt the Twi'lek, just like I hurt your woman. Naruto frowned and suddenly, Maul couldn't move. His blade would no longer descend. He struggled and strained, using all his might but to no avail with each passing second his prey straightened, until it was Maul who was unable to sustain the effort. Maul who was forced backwards, forced to deactivate the second blade to break free just as Qui Gon's lightsaber sizzled through the tip of a horn. The heat scaled the Zabrak's scalp like a burning brand, eliciting a roar of pain as the Jedi leapt away. That was when he heard it. Shinra Tensei. The sage pushed outward just as he turned, an explosion of force that nearly ripped Darth Maul from its feet. He managed to shield himself from it with the dark side somehow, leaving himself on the back foot. Now it was lost to him, his rhythm, and back to his adversaries once more. 
The pair followed, one coming up in front of him, one behind, so that they had him pinned in between them. Down the corridors they fought, lightsabers flashing, sparks flying from the metal railing of the walls as they smashed against it. Grunts of exertion as arms pumped, lightsabers flashed. Maul dimly realized they had forced him into the hangar bay now so focused had he been upon his battle that he'd failed to be mindful of his surroundings. Even now he could see starfighters taking off around him, pilots scrambling to escape the conflict. A stray glance confirmed that the hologram emitter of Darth Sidious had followed after them, his master silently observing his desperate defense with a disproving eye. That image was cut off as Naruto hurled an empty starfighter at him with his mind, its hull shrieking as it shot across the floor to slam into his unguarded flank. This momentary lapse a most cost the Zabrak most dear, scarce had he thrown the Nubian vessel away than the pair was upon him, driving him back once more. Fury boiled in Maul's mind as he alighted upon. No, this wasn't happening. His fury built, culminating in an explosion of the force, pushing qui -Gon back. Naruto didn't budge. His fury was gone now, replaced by a like-minded smile he'd worn only a few moments before. Confidence. What's wrong, horn boy? He purred, all out of tricks. No. Maul lashed outward, his newfound power arcing forward in a jagged stream of purple lightning. Force lightning. It was a technique he'd recently learned in the last three days and, while distasteful for a warrior such as himself, it was a last resort. For the first time since their duel began, Naruto roared in pain. His body bent double, bowing beneath wave after wave of electricity, lightsaber falling from his nerveless fingers. Finally, he'd been beaten. Bested. No more of his smile. No more laughter. No more. I am Darth Maul. He roared. And I command your respect. Heh. <sighs> his satisfaction ended shortly as Naruto straightened under the deluge, facing him with a small chuckle. Despite the voltage still arcing off his body, he seemed virtual unharmed, lightsaber cut down at his shoulder and bounced harmlessly off with a dizzying pop. Damned the scar. No, Naruto replied, rising to his feet. You demand your own destruction. Qui Gon. Maul's gaze snapped toward the older Jedi just in time to find him battered and bruised, but still very much alive. Alive and hurtling the hilt of his lightsaber towards Naruto. The blonde caught and ignited it, leaving him with dual blades of the deepest, greenest hue. His chakra cloak engulfed him, the golden shroud sending all his wounds sizzling shut in an instant leaving him whole and unharmed once more. Powerless, Maul felt all of his fury build, driving him to the point of no return. I don't have to take this from you, he hissed, driving his hilt upwards, striking the hunter's visage in a series of vicious blunt strikes. You, woman serving, ancient, cowardly. Naruto's head leaned forward, revealing Maul's most deep-seated fear. He'd caught the hilt with his teeth. With his teeth. Somehow someway he'd managed to get his mouth around the impossibly long handle before the Sith could follow through and strike him in the head. He grinned around the hilt, crimson eyes regarding him eerily, as though he were a mere dust moat beneath the blonde's gaze. The gaze of the shinobi means, a loving husband, and pissed off father, it was possibly the most terrifying thing he'd seen in all of his existence. The funny thing is, he bit down with a chuckle, shattering the sabers into two halves. Maul staggered backwards, clutching the remaining shaft of his blade, now reduced to a single solitary blade the other end utterly useless. Irate, Maul made the mistake of trying to club Naruto with it. The blonde caught it and with his crush gaunts, reduced the metal to mere powder in his hand. And then he began to advance. He didn't even bother himself to block. In that instant, it was as if he didn't care what happened to his body. In any other circumstance, you might have had a point there. Grinning, he continued his inexorable advance, arms spread wide sabers scraping crows the floor. Except my wife is awesome, I was a foolish bastard in my twenties, I kill every you own equally, and there's no one alive who can comprehend my violent preference. So in other words, my dear horn boy, and here he did stop, towering over Maul like a great, golden god. His lightsabers flashed upward with a hiss and cut down in an instant. Check your privilege. Tain accompanied those words, his twin blade biting down agonizingly against Maul's midsection. Numbness shot through his spine and for a moment, the Zabrak dared to hope his would be a painless death. Wrong. He had only just thought such a thing when a searing wave of agony spread up through his lower body, then nothingness. The last thing he saw as the blonde reached down for him was the sever half of his torso lying in a twitching, spasmodic heap and those awful Rinnegan eyes looming down for his very soul. And then the blonde's fingers found his face. He woke to find himself in blackness. Imagine you were dying, said the figure in the dark. Maul stiffened. Oh God, imagine you were afraid and a long way from home, and in terrible pain. And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse you looked up. 
The shadow surrounding the figure's face finally fell away to reveal a face that Maul had since learned to fear, the Shinobi menace. The face of the devil himself. Hello, little Sifling. Maul tried to move but found himself pinned in place by the force. It was as if a great weight had settled around his shoulders, holding him fast, denying any sort of escape. Ah, uh, tisk the menace while wagging his finger. Be a good boy, and let me pick your mind. He grinned as bent down to place the previously wagging finger on the defeated Sith's forehead. Owen, this is going to hurt like a bitch, in fact you may just die. Rinnegan eyes flared, his voice taking on an almost demonic tone. I help you in Juhui. And with that Darth Maul felt his mind being torn apart as the menace raped his mind for information on everything he knew, leaving absolutely nothing behind. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 4. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author Neon Zenjetsu on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.